Hello, Mr. Elliot Rosenstock. How are you, dude? Hi, Dustin. It's good to see you. It's good to see you face to face for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm doing all right. It's the weekend, so I'm relaxing. I'm drinking a nice, nice uh, cup of coffee and then talking to you. Excellent. I see that you're celebrating Hanukkah. Is that right? Yeah, it's, I still have all this back here. Like the holiday ended, but you know, the more oh, I read, over. is it over? Yeah, already? it's over already. But the more I read Spinoza, the more I'm like more into the Jew thing. You know, cool. the Spinoza and pantheism. You just keep tracing. Because we're talking about Zizek in the clinic, right? And the funny thing about Zizek is if you really want to engage with him, you sort of have to go through the entire canon of Western philosophy <laughs> and you can just keep going. So you have to go through, you have to go to Lacan, which means you have to go to Freud. And then you have to go to Hegel, which means you sort of have to go to Spinoza and Kant. And, you know, it's, it's a trip. <laughs> Fair enough. I yeah. tend to have a, a different philosophy about all such intellectual reading and learning projects. Well, tell is, me about it. Yeah. Well, basically, you can just jump in wherever you want, and you don't have to worry about knowing everything else. I think there's a problem where it's like people sometimes get obsessed with trying to understand all the antecedents and how things fit into these larger pictures. Uh, but that can be so daunting to people, and it is so daunting that uh, it can actually stop a lot of people in their tracks. Whereas yeah. I think people should be a little, people should allow themselves to be a little bit more irresponsible and just uh, pick up what, it's, what intrigues them and uh, not really worry about going through all the back catalog, except where they're genuinely on a line of, of personal curiosity and interest. Well, the funny thing is, you know, and even to further your point is the more you sort of follow the line, the more unlike the contemporary thinker you might be, because then you're just, you're almost subverting them by like really looking into their sort of source material to the point where it's just like, <laughs> you're, you're sort of negating the contemporary theorist thought and you're saying, Oh, well, let's look at this source material and let's see what else we can do with this source material. Right. And, you know, Zizek was the guy who integrated Hegel and Lacan. So if you, if you look at that sort of combination and Hegel's sort of process of logic and then integrating uh, Lacan and, and the real and the sort of the, the trouble with the absolute, you know, you can, you can go from that point and then go forward. And it's sort of Zizek's starting point, but it's not quite Zizek, right? So if right. you jump in and, Z, to, and if you don't read that and then maybe jump right into Zizek, you might even get a better view of Zizek. Or a more accurate view of Zizek himself, if you're like trying to recreate. Right on, right on. Who wants, like that. That? So, Who wants to recreate somebody? That's boring. I think we should definitely <laughs> talk about Zizek, uh, but I think we should circle back to that a little bit later in the conversation. Fair enough. I, I'd love to start a little bit with, if you don't mind, a little bit about you because we've chatted a bit before, but I don't know that much about you personally. And you know, Elliot, I'm I'm a people person. I really like people. You know, I see that. I see that in you. Thank it's you. Really, yeah. it's really nice to see. Thank you. I really yeah. genuinely like people and I like talking with people and I like that, that human connection. You know what I mean? I'm not like one of these edgy, cold accelerationist types who like, you know, has an aesthetics of, you know, machines and anti-humanism. Mm. I like humans uh, as unfashionable as that is. Yeah. I think, I think insofar as I am a sort of, I guess, cold, bur cold burning accelerationist type, it's really more of a matter of personality. Like when it comes right down to it, like I like talking with people, but you know, I always see it as I talk with people in my own interests. And if you sort of look, um, look at humans as part of the system and you don't try to take them out of the system, like the sort of inhuman uh, accelerationists might, you get a, you get a better view of it. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. you ask yeah. questions, well, I'm just fucking rambling. I mean, my take is, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, sorry. Did I cut you off? What'd you say? No, nothing. I was like, you ask questions. I don't, you know. Yeah, no, that's probably better questions than, than I, I was only going to add to that, that, I mean, I do, I do think that capitalism is increasingly cold and a lot of the current, current affairs that are kind of most important and necessary to understand do require a, a heavy dose of analytical coldness. And in a lot of ways, human warmth is today uh, a major problem actually for the ability for people to actually parse what's what's going on because it is so brutal 
Uh, so analytically and intellectually, I definitely understand and and sympathize with, and and to some degree, I do practice uh, that kind of uh, exercised cultivation of analytical coldness. There's something about that that's real and appropriate and makes sense to me right now, and that I practice. But I don't think that means that in your personal life and in your actual you know conduct of everyday everyday life that you can't you know be really warm and uh, and and human and humane and and interpersonally uh, generous and sympathetic. Uh, which is also what I try to practice, uh, you know, as evident, I think, or I hope in these in these live streams or whatever. So that's just a bit of a gloss on, I guess, uh, the, the aesthetics of coldness and uh, how th this live stream and I guess my my MO in this live streams are, you know, very incongruous with the that aesthetics of coldness that I do actually sometimes practice in, analytically. What is your MO in this in these live streams? Uh, my MO, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm reflecting back what I have been, uh, kind of given by the, the people, by the masses. Huh. The, I don't, I don't really know what my MO is exactly, except for weird messages and, you know, the, the memes I see that have been made about me and that, that sort of stuff. Like I process that and I have a little bit of a sense of what, of what my MO is. But other than that, I don't really, uh, I'm not too self-conscious about it. Well, I know you're on a search for a sort of authenticity, right? Yeah, that's and a that's a fine way to put it. I'm happy with that statement. Because I know there's, you know, wh whether or not something might be effective for a career or for something else is not sort of what seems to drive you. Like, you really seem to be on that. Uh, on, what I'm not sure what that authenticity would turn out to be, but it's, but another thing which is interesting, speaking of capitalism, or you could call it, you could call it not even capitalism, but um, uh, what, what I don't know, sort of Darwinian, Darwinian cold um, effort you put into things. I think uh, whether or not um, people buy into your dialectic or they're like, the fact is that you, you know, you're, you're a professor. Whether or not you know whatever's happening with your professorship is you sort of put in this this uh, effort into into this sort of circle and this sort of area of philosophical thought to a point where other people don't and it's like detailed in a, in a, in to an extent where where you are doing it at the highest amount and you get the returns for that hmm. right so you are sort of get so it's like the nice part about the machine process or the sort of uh, the systemic look is you're, you know, you know, you don't need it. You don't need to convince people. There's sort of like a machinic um, input you're putting in, and you're getting the output from it. You're getting like Nick Land to talk with you, and I just heard you're getting Reza to talk with you, and that's. I think that's a direct result. It's, I don't, you know, Nick Land would probably call it capitalism, but <laughs> I don't know if you could call it capitalism. It's just sort of machine, you're, uh, machine part, and you know, I'm drinking this coffee right now, and you can sort of, <laughs> you can sort of look like look to uh if you look at the acceleration sphere as one big machine and you look at justin murphy as sort of like a drug like caffeine is like a drug it like has this it has like a certain effect right it has a certain effect on the entire thing which sort of permeates uh throughout it just as like, like i have an effect it might not be as pronounced right nick land definitely has an effect but everybody sort of is affecting this machine and if you if you put in more energy into this machine it's going to like, it just circulates through the machine, just like, you know, yeah. any city or body. Hell yeah. That's awesome. I, I really like that way of putting it. And thank you also for the kind words, but I think that's, that's exactly right. Like everyone should try to be an accelerant to others, but it, you know, like in a way that, uh, it's like mutually, mutually productive. Right. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is you can't help but to be an accelerant. That's what's so great about acceleration. True, but surely, <laughs> surely we can distinguish between kind of desirable, ethically attractive, aesthetically attractive forms of uh, kind of participation in in the hive mind and uh, undesirable, unethical, ugly uh, forms of, yeah. of, of of acceleration. Right. So, you know, I know there's this idea that even the kind of resentful, uh, you know, decelerationist kind of uh, how should I put it? Uh, 
the, you know, the, the, the parts of, uh, you know, the, the body politic today that are mostly defined by resentment and, uh, basically trying to block off, uh, flows of life, uh, to, you know, defend themselves or their, their own people or whatever the case might be basically, you know, uh, kind of reactionary, whether it be on the left or the right kind of reactionary, resentful tendencies, they, they are definitely, they play a role in, in the acceleration of capitalism because it's precisely, that's precisely the blockage that, uh, inspires and incentivizes techno capital to become ever more sophisticated, to route around the, the blocks of, of resentment in the body politic. Uh, well, that's the beauty yeah. of it is even when they work in and for themselves to perpetuate their own sort of dialectic, um, if they really under, if I would say like the Hegelian and like the Marxists who like to call themselves Hegelian, uh, sort of kept going and, and looked at their sort of systemic effect, I think it would, you know, <laughs> it's the, like, yeah, it's like you said, there's a, they have, they have, they ha I don't know. I get, I got yeah. lost. This happens no. to me sometimes where I'm like, I'm like sort of talking and then it's, I think um what I'm saying is sort of like congruent to what you were saying, but it was, but I just, I just sort of lost myself. Forget it. That's cool, man. <laughs> there's a reason I forgot it. Though. There's like a, yeah. there's like part of me that repressed that. So that's the Freudian, <laughs> that's the Freudian aspect. If I was to be a good psychoanalyst right now, there's like, there's a reason I stopped that line. I didn't do it on purpose. Is that true? Do you think, do you believe in that idea? I think it, I think it's definitely true. And if I had to explore it some more, I would say it was my heavy involvement with left politics. Um, and I think left politics does an important work. And I think um, my brain just like blotted it out. <laughs> what I was going to say. Interesting. <laughs> like as I was, yeah. So because I do. Of, yeah. That's, well, that's Freud. Of, of, of reprisal or what? No, it's, I would say it's myself. It's, I blotted out the idea that you are the captain of your ship. The whole idea of the Freudian unconscious is you're not your ego is not is not the director necessarily, and they're de they're competing sort of dissonances. So to know yourself as uh, as this sort of multiple entity with intrinsic cognitive uh, dissonances, which is not like I wouldn't say if it's a bug or a feature so much as it's just the it's the hardware of being alive is like. You're just, that's, that's, the, that's the mechanism. And that's what Freud does is he sort of charted it. Yeah. 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 I, I, I buy a lot of that. So let's, get, let's learn a little bit, a little bit about you, Elliot. Uh, where yeah. are you, where are you right now? Can you say? <laughs> yeah, I'm in uh, Culver city, which is in Los Angeles. There's various parts of Los Angeles. If you ever want to find out what a city state, what would be like, you should move to Los Angeles because it's a bunch of little nation states with very distinct characteristics like I you know I go to work and I work in South Central it's on the same street but it's five miles uh, east it's like a different world and you'll meet people there that haven't been like five miles north of where they're living like they haven't been to north of downtown so it's almost like you're driving into a different nation with no passport depending on where you go in the city you can go to Culver City and it's right next to Inglewood which is right next to you know um Westchester, which is, and these these all have very distinct characteristics. Yeah, dude, I know all about all those places because I listen to rap music. That's cool. Inglewood, <laughs> Inglewood, I know all about that. Uh, do, do you hang out with famous people all the time? No. Do you see them a lot? When I was um, when I first learned to not uh, do drugs all the time, I would see them more because I would go to like Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, I did. I did that for a bit. You see a lot of them there, which is it's all. Yeah, it's like it's a kind of networking opportunity. No, it's the it's the opposite. It's almost like they miss the name of the father, so they need so the celebrities like they go to these Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, and they're just imposed. They love this. They're like suddenly they have a rule set, and they're not being. It's like a sort of like maybe a safe space. Interesting. <laughs> you might want to say. Yeah. So they're looking but, for the name of the father. You say? Yeah, they. I think so. I like I don't want to name drop because that's like that's like a, you're not supposed to do that, <laughs> but it's like you you see like plenty of you know very very famous people, and then you know drop a name. No, I can't. I'll just say like a musician for a very famous, like the lead singer of a very famous band in California, 
like and he was like very famous like i would go and see him when i was like younger and i like saw him on the stage and he was like yeah it's like what elliot was saying and i was like oh wow that's really something <laughs> <laughs> but then you leave and you realize it's sort of like a temporary experience. And then it's like, what do I make of this sort of fragmented experience? Right. For listeners who don't know what the name of the father is. And I only vaguely do, to be honest. Uh, could you, <laughs> could you tell us what, what that means? Name of the father is the imposition of the rule set that uh, integrates you into an order, a symbolic order. So if you're uh, a celebrity uh, and you're given, you have millions of dollars. So you have, you can basically, fulfill any sort of hedonistic wish you want and you also have social capital uh so if you look at celebrities like royalty because that's the closest thing we have to like a royal a royal sigil is oh you're a celebrity right so you have the sigil and you have the money and you basically almost don't have to follow a lot of traditional societal rules because you you're given this sort of position right so what happens is people spend all their money and they use it and then they eventually they they find that they're miserable and then they wonder why they're miserable. And part of it is because you're not integrated into society anymore. You're, so you try to be above society and you find out it's like, wait a minute. Um, <laughs> actually, I sort of want to be part of society. That's sort of how I get all my meaning. And if you're sort of thrown outside of the symbolic order through, through an injection into your, into your bloodstream of capital and fame, um, like, a heavy injection, then you might you might lose it. You just lose your mind, you know. Right. Okay, right. Yeah. So just yeah. just like any drug, like a Justin Murphy in an Excel sphere, like an Elliot Rosenstock in a live stream, or like a <laughs> like you know, like caffeine in a body. It's it works the same way. It's, yeah. So you know, like systems if, are systems. If this conversation gets too good, it might really destroy people's names of the father, and then like their future might be destroyed, possibly. Well, no, because they have to um. They're they're still the they're still the body, right? Uh, they're still the the you know I'm big on egoism. They're still their individual sort of selves, so they can be ex you know they're they're exposed to this conversation, <laughs> but there's but it still goes through the system, which is their body, which is their sort of life, which is their sort of hard hardwired systems where they get money and material out of, and it's this is this is they're watching this on a screen or a phone or whatever. Okay, so it's so not going, it's, it won't have a material, like they're not gonna watch this and then suddenly their job like totally changes structure, right? Or something right. like that. No matter how good this, what, no matter how good my content is, it's not gonna destroy people's names of the father because it's because of kind of intrinsic structural limitations on that. However, if I, yeah. if I, you know, if my live stream and my, my content creation really took off and I started getting mad money from fans, I could potentially uh, lose the name of the father and everything would come unhinged. Is that true? Yeah. Can you think of any philosophers who may have dealt with that? Are you, <laughs> who are you subtweeting? <laughs> who am I subtweeting? I don't know. I'm just saying, um, I'm just saying like, if you, if you <laughs> like, I mean, generally like making a lot of money is usually not a problem for many philosophers. Yeah, philosophers. That's true. Very true. Uh, okay, interesting. So that was a good little digression on a Lacanian concept. Now, are you a Lacanian, would you say? Uh, I like to say I'm the pioneer of Zizekian psychotherapy. Okay. <laughs> I, like I like it. Yeah, because why? Oh, you know, it's funny, but it's also, it's, it's true. Am I not? <laughs> How old are you? So it's like, I'm, I'm uh, 29. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm 29. So, okay. So, Maybe that that's, I think, enough about you. Uh, you know, I, I get your basic. I, I'd like to learn a little bit more about you, but I think the conversation is naturally just, it keeps going right into the, the good meaty stuff. So I think instead of trying to forestall that in the name of preliminary niceties, I think we should just plow on forward. And why don't you tell us in your own terms, just to kick things off, you know, what is, what is the Zizekian uh, idea of psychotherapy? Um, it's a big question. Uh, the way I, I'll start with the sort of process and then I'll like, sure. And then I'll, and then you can ask about it and maybe we'll, it'll be, that'll be the easier way than to sort of give you the whole thing. So the process sure. is, uh, in a sort of Lacanian way, you sort of gather master signifiers and themes, um, which are, this, this was an argument I had with the 
publisher really, and it wasn't really an argument so much as like a cold war regarding uh, what value means, especially if it's a Marxist uh, theory company <laughs> like Zero Books. Um, value refers to uh, material, mater not abstract. It's like completely like contra the liberal idea of value. So, but Zizek doesn't really do that. So I'm like, it's like, well, it's like it's in Zizek. So the event, the values in, and uh, so I basically take two categories, which are values that people hold, which are master signifiers and themes. Like I said, for you, authenticity is a value, right? That's a yeah. value. And you, so you get one of them. We are, right now we have one. I don't have a second one. But if we had a second one, uh, we could smash them together. And and then we could we could look at sort of your the finite events. So the second part is events, and um, we could see how they manifest in sort of from the abstract or universal absolute into specific um, events in this person's life. And we could see how the sort of absolute idea of these themselves uh, crash into each other and they contradict each other. So within these sort of forms of our values and entrance into language or the symbolic order as Lacan would call it, there is this, there's this conflict that's brought from language uh, itself. And um, when you get into the finite uh, uh, actual events, um, you can see people struggle with them. So the algorithmic process, which, you know, I almost wish I didn't say that because it's kind of kitschy, but that's what it is. It's a sorting mechanism, an yeah. algorithm. So how do you how do you sort these language, um, you know, values within the finite things? And that's what through sort of the dialectic process of therapy, which is me as a therapist and someone as a client, uh, they sort of figure out how to sort things um, with with their events in their lives, and they sort of figure out how to uh, tackle future events in their lives. So then. You know, some schools of therapy are really big on unconditional positive regard, which is like, oh, Justin, everything you do is good. like, who wants to hear that? <laughs> um, but no, this is this is a more this is a colder, uh, much colder um, perspective, which is you you give people their contradictions and you sort of help them uh, work through it, and that helps them with the skill set, which is working through these contradictions themselves okay. through events and then they go get new events and then when new events happen it's like oh i i know how to do this i know how to okay. sort my values right okay so you kind of take the lacanian notions about the symbolic order and how we are as subjects integrated into this symbolic order that's kind of the lacanian component and then it sounds like what makes this zizekian is the this kind of hegelian layer that you just articulated about understanding the relationship between contingent events in your own life yeah, and, well, the how that, is, and how that relates to the symbolic order? Yeah, the Zizekian part is uh, the parallax, which is these two things that don't come together but are nonetheless sort of related. And the way the, the thing that sticks them together is the event. So these values aren't related, but through the event, they're, they, they're necessarily um, – I'm related, and the map of it, the map actually changes the event once you, which is um, Zizek, what Zizek writes about in the parallax view, which mm. is the, the actual fact that the, ther uh, uh, the therapy provides a map um, to a client to some degree, which is based on their own info. It's like, this is what you're telling me. This is what I'm seeing. Is this right? And that, you know, it registers to the client. It's like, this is true. This is what I did say. This is what I do think. This is what I do care about. It registers as true because it is true. Hmm. So part of it is bringing to the attention of of the client their own sort of truth values and then helping them negotiate those truth values. Um, right. Okay. So are, are the common forms of psychopathology that you deal with, I mean, in the, in the psychoanalytic tradition, we might call them neurosis, right, or hysteria or whatever. These are obviously outdated terms, but just to link it back to, uh, you know, the the kind of tradition that we're talking in um, or, or today, you know, people might use words like, uh, anxiety, you know, anxiety and depression or whatever. Um, are these common recurring forms of psychopathology? Do you there like therefore locate them as wh where in the model you just described does, does psychopathology enter? 
you know, when it comes to his, hysteria in the classic sense, I almost, it's almost all language is the problem. So the idea that, oh, I'm going to cure hysteria this way and this the other way. Hysteria is the somatization of, um, of language. So it's like it's not expressed with words, but say someone expresses it with the body. And so it's, you know, just, just as someone sort of, it might not be flushed out the most, but it still sort of works in the same way, um, giving, giving people these sort of principles and um, giving people essentially themselves and their own contradictions and helping them work through them. It would work with sort of, I guess you could call it hysteria, but I mean, if you're going to modern terminology with depression, it gives people a way forward uh, who are depressed. It's like, it's just like, this is what, you know, this is a way forward. You're stuck, you're in a bind, you're in a double bind or whatever. There's right. a way forward. So uh, even, even schizophrenia, schizophrenia as well, so, uh, schizoaffective disorder which is bipolar schizophrenia this you know it it has a it has positive effects and i'm lucky enough to be in a clinic um that lets me lets me use um this therapy from a new sort of yeah right so you actually practice this uh kind of a uh, novel psychotherapeutic framework that you've developed you use this on a daily basis with patients is that right that's correct that's that's really interesting, you know, because a lot of people look at someone like Zizek and they think this is just like the the height of excessive uh, philosophical speculation and nonsense, which, which is what a lot of people think. Surely this can't have any traction on the real world. So on the, well, the real world is psychotherapy. Look at what psychotherapy is. Psychotherapy is the idea that two people can sit and talk to each other and you're going to have a profound impact on the other person. So exactly what is that is supposed to be more <laughs> like yeah. that's that's what you're working. So if you like really break this down, it's two people sitting like I do this in the book just because I'm probably like obsessed with the mapping of it. I'm like, this is what psychotherapy is. You know, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about two people and like not two people in a room talking, sitting, chairs facing each other uh, and you know, doing this doing this process. So, yeah, right, right. So I don't want to reduce what you said before, but for people listening, just trying to pin things down, is it fair to say that what you were saying before is that a lot of forms of common psychopathology kind of boil down to people having certain symbolic attachments or just basically certain ideas that they have in their head that are contradictory and that causes different types of suffering? Language is contradictory, and ideas are contradictory to themselves. Intrinsically, take, you think? Intrinsically. So you, intri you think that people are kind of destined to have irresolvable contradictions? That is like a very Freudian way to think about it, I guess. Yeah, well, it's also Hegelian, right? Mm -hmm. The A doesn't equal A. There's something okay. in A. When you, you know, there's something in the thing itself which isn't the self. There's something in, you know, the Eliot that right now that isn't the Eliot, you would call it, right? Oh, yeah, there's I something in the Justin that isn't the Justin, right? So there's like, Justin doesn't equal Justin. Like, what does that mean? It does mean something when I nah, say- No, nah, dude, I'm just pure Justin, man. You're just pure Justin? <laughs> Your thing might be true of other people, but not me. <laughs> Dang, well, I'm there you kidding. go, Hegel uh, disproven. Okay, so can you, could you give us an example of like, in your framework, like how, how do you differentiate different forms of psychopathology? Like how is depression different than you know, something you might counterpose to it? Well, depression has a certain set of um, symptoms. So if you're working with depression, uh, you might be dealing with uh, symptoms of isolation, of, you know, inability to enjoy, uh, stuff like that. Right. Uh, you might might be dealing with anxiety as well versus someone like schizophrenia. You're dealing with um, hallucinations and you're dealing with uh uh, persecutory um, paranoia and stuff like that. Right. And so how do your interventions differ for these different forms is what I mean. Well, what where I sort of differ is I don't really, I, I work with sort of where, what the client gives me. So the client gives me one thing and you can, once you sort of flush it out, this is sort of the Hegelian method, which is once you sort of flush something out to its very end where it doesn't contradict itself, that's sort of internal tension sort of gets resolved to some degree, okay. which is not, it's not cool to say synthesis anymore, but <laughs> kind of is, but it's, it's not cool. So I would never say it. Okay. So uh, the internal tension gets resolved to a point, but then once that point is reached, 
that's when the entire thing gets sort of you can it gets negated by something else by the by another part because you sort of resolved this internal tension like maybe i think back to maybe when you were 20 or so something that was really important to you and you sort of figured it out and you sort of mastered it to a degree and you sort of got good at it and then boom on to the next thing a little bit but the next thing is related it has some sort of essential quality that builds upon this so for instance me being a therapist you know when i was 18 before like facebook philosophy groups you know i i was like i was like i wanted a facebook philosophy group i didn't know i did but i would like i like looked at my friend i'm like man why is there no philosophy group on campus this sucks should they be like i'm in college where's the where is it and then suddenly you know the internet provided or whatever and there's there's you can talk with people about philosophy and so then it turned started from there and then there's some political theory Got introduced to Zizek as an undergrad. I actually thought he was very right wing. I was like, why am I reading this? That was <laughs> that was my first Zizek impression when I was like 19. And uh, <laughs> um, a lot and of people then, have that impression right now. Yeah, th which is funny because that's how that's where I started. So I kind of get it, right? Yeah. You, you, you go in sort of with the untrained mind with sort of general liberal ideology, and you see Zizek, and it's like this kind of right wing. <laughs> well, I mean, my take is that he's he's actually just a genuine thinker, and genuine thinkers basically just pursue their own lines of flight, and it lands them in all different types of strange places. So they generally, like, all genuine thinkers tend to be genuinely hard to place for natural reasons. Yeah. Well, and if 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 you look at it like a good a good chess player, you you have to think of the best move of your opponent. So your opponent, you have to give your opponent the credit of being able to come up with the best move against you. So if you don't, so when you practice and you don't do that against yourself, you're not going to make the right move next because you haven't practiced against the best move. So that's why, you know, I, I learned about left theory and I, you know, I learned a lot about like Austrian economics and stuff like that. So yeah, and that, <laughs> what that results in is like some guy who goes, who's not, I don't know. Like I guess I call myself an anarchist, but I, you know, I work, I do stuff with the IWW sometimes, uh -huh. and then I organize my workplace to negotiate collectively. Is how that really manifests finitely. So you could call me a, I don't know. Some people would be like, oh, you, you're, you're, you're not a real leftist, or, or like, I don't know, you're this or that. It's like, well, how it manifests is I, you know, I help people organize themselves together and collectively mm -hmm. act. You know, right? So, I, I, I see the connection. For sure. So <laughs> is. Is your in your psychotherapy is is the is the primary mechanism the talk therapy idea that it's in the actual conversations you're having with these people that the stuff is being worked out or do you assign them behavioral types of modifications and stuff like that? I do sometimes. Like sometimes I have to. Sometimes you're required to do like a, a behavioral intervention. Okay. Um, but for the for the kind of uh, prototypical Zizekian psychotherapy intervention is is it primarily understood as it's, taking place in the, in the talking uh, yeah well it's a little logic goes a long way and i think um you you might not be exposed to people who have zero exposure to psycho uh, psychotherapy philosophy or politics even um but i am every day um so the people i talk to are not um other philosophy people they're like you know, they're people with free insurance or, or state insurance rather. <laughs> so it's like, so that's why it's a little bit of logic in terms of, well, here, here you have this and this manifests like this and here you have this and this, this sort of manifests like this and see how this theme relates to this other theme that's been sort of happening since uh, childhood. And that's what I mean by the symptom, which is what I talk about in the book, which is you sort of take the symptom. The idea isn't you, which is where Zizek and Lacan would be different than um, behavior, cognitive techniques, which is cognitive techniques by definition. And this is why I'm allowed to do my um, therapy, by the way, is because you have to have two goals <laughs> and then they have to reach the goal. So they're like, whatever you say that makes them reach the goal, if they reach the goal is fine. Okay. Like, okay. So that's 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 my particular department. So I'm in this department called Triple R. Don't ask me what it stands for, but it, it means that. That's what it means. Okay. <laughs> Something about you know, and um, but there's like more like heavy duty departments where it has like an entire like treatment team, and then people that are you know. So I see, but, but 
Okay. Point being, point being, that's that's irrelevant. So the, what I was talking about is the symptom versus getting rid of the symptom, which are those two things, versus you take the symptom, the Lunkanian symptom, which is the schema that people. It's like if I said something to you and it was universally true to some degree, like the the search for authenticity, it was true. It's not like your symptom though necessarily, but it's like this has truth in that when I hear it, I, it resonates from a lot of my different actions. So I just sort of like, well, here you go. <laughs> right. And then it's like, huh. So that gets brought into consciousness. But then there's more of that. There's more, you know, in the process of like, if you're doing psychotherapy, there's more. So more of that stuff gets brought up. And then the idea is not to be like, oh, ergo, whatever the symptom is, is bad, which is like the cognitive style, whatever the symptom is, is bad. And I think that's what people think about it themselves is you say, well, you take your symptom and you sort of wrap it. You sort of you you accelerate it, accelerate accelerate the symptom. All Acceleration right. of psychotherapy. You take it and you wrap it around the vents, <laughs> and you just go with it. Okay. Right. And then it's like, well, your symptoms are reduced, and people are like, wow. Like I like to check in with people. It's like, how's things? How are things going? I, it always feels good when someone goes like, yeah, it's going really. Good. Okay, so that's cool. Let's pause on that for a second. I'm I'm very yeah. intrigued by that. So real quick, the to recap the the symptom. Is kind of like the symptom, but it's a Lacanian concept that basically it sounds like it refers to kind of like a focal point, could you say? Yeah, like and a core concept. Say you get in trouble. Well, if I was a cognitivist and I looked at uh, Justin Murphy, the public intellectual, <laughs> and I and I and if I was a cognitivist, it's like, oh, well, he searches for authenticity and he got in trouble at uh, his school because he did this and then he got in trouble. Ergo, it's bad. And ergo, we're gonna we're gonna give him a cognitive reframe, and we're gonna give him a you know a set of moral principles. For, versus, I was like, don't don't worry, I'm not gonna do. It. Don't worry, Justin. I don't want to <laughs> go for it. I like this. Go for it. Uh, go deeper, versus, dude. We take your uh, you Tell we right. take your your search for authenticity, and we look at your the event of like this. It's like, oh man, so authenticity. This happened. Now what's now what's next in order to sort of do this? What do you have online? It's like, well, I have this, and I said, well, how can it so what what do you think for that? And that's where I sort of leave you, and then the, that's where the dialectic starts from the other person, and then it's like, okay, so this is what's next with that, and this is what's next with my search, and it's okay. not that, and it causes me pain because it's so it's such a core concept of my life, and it causes different events which are stressful, but it's a core. So the idea is sim the symptom is where you get meaning, so you can't get rid of it because it's your source of meaning. It's okay. like getting rid of the sun because it gives causes skin cancer. That makes a lot of sense to me. That yeah. that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's very cool. I think I could even give you some examples in my own life where I feel like I've kind of intuitively taken on that kind of practical philosophy in some sense as a as a psychological coping mechanism in some sense. And I think it works. I think that is actually a really good way to do it, if I'm understanding you correctly. And if I am correct, that I sometimes do an intuitive model of that. Like I'll give you an example, for instance. Yeah, go for it. Um, something else I'm kind of obsessed with, I guess you could call it an, a, a, sim, a symptom is um it's very it's similar to authenticity i guess but it's honesty a little bit more specific mm -hmm. i've always been kind of obsessed with honesty and that's why i'm kind of like an oversharer and a uh, kind of compulsive talker uh is because i i ever since i was young i've i've had this kind of fear of deception fear of both being deceived but also a fear of deceiving others and that's partially because i was raised catholic and I had a very conservative uh, Sunday school teacher who who basically made me think whether she meant to or not. I, I came away with the idea when I was like very young, like eight years old or something like that. There were there was a couple of years in my life where I really thought on a literal basis that if I told a lie to anyone, uh, I would go to hell. <laughs> and I really thought that. And it, it actually like really uh, had long term effects on me because for these like two years of my life, I would go around compulsively. Kind of like yeah, like some kind of like someone with OCD. Like after I talked with anyone, I mm -hmm. would follow up with them like five minutes later, two days later, just to clarify that they understood what I said, that they understood correctly. Because I thought if they misunderstood me, maybe God would be watching that and think that was me lying, and therefore I would go to hell. I was like, I did this like really hardcore to to a, 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 a simply pathological degree for a couple of years in my early life. Um, mm -hmm. another, another thing is that I also. Um, watchers of my stream have might know this already. So I won't go, I won't beat a dead horse, but uh, very early in my life, I probably got involved in like sexual behavior, like at an unhealthy age, as most people I think do at an unhealthy age nowadays. 
but I was like cheated on a couple times by like very early uh, romantic partners when I was like, tw like, I don't know, fifth grade or however, however old you are then. And, uh, and that made me like very, very sensitive uh, to like, fear of abandonment like I I, I kind of thought like everyone I I'd ever you know share my life or time with would like betray me or leave me or whatever like I became very sensitive to that fear and kind of obsessed with that fear I became very sensitive to the threat of betrayal basically and mm. so these are two kind of overlapping you know uh kind of I, I don't want to call them traumatic experiences but in a way like you know formative early kind of threat sensitivity situations and that, that, that were very formative. And as I grew up, I kind of, you know, I always kind of realized like these were like abnormal kind of pathological vulnerabilities or, or problems with my psyche. And I, I kind of ended up dealing with it by owning it and kind of like trying to make good out of it. And mm. it just made me, I was like, the only way I can deal with this is I have to be, I have to actually say to myself like oh honesty is really really important and people are bad because they don't do it enough therefore like i will just make that a part of my identity and a part of yeah. my style for like moving forward and making friends on that basis and selecting you know romantic partners on that basis and and then like spinning out and now i'm i'm like 31 i'm 32 years old and i'm like still spinning out this kind of like almost political philosophy around you know, the, the necessity of honesty and the, you know, the, the political problems of all of these like lying fake ass adults who like dominate the public sphere. And, uh, yeah. So in some ways I'm, I'm even everything I'm doing right now, I'm just trying to positively spin out the implications of like formatively, uh, really painful childhood experiences. <laughs> yeah. Well, another way to look at it is you're putting the work into honesty. Just like I said, you're putting the work in the cello sphere you're putting the work into honesty and seeing and you're prioritizing that and see, and then it sort of has these resounding implications. And is that an example though, of like basically the method that you have honed in on? Yeah. I mean, what you just said is bringing, bringing that into consciousness and bringing the honesty and it's linked to um, f uh, fear and how it feeds back onto itself, right? The feedback loop, the honesty, and then the dislike of deception is, I would say part of on, it's like part of it. Right. right. So you're kind of like an accelerationist uh, psychologist. Is I that? Know, it's, it's wonderful. Is that Isn't true? It? Is that kind of how yeah, you see it a little yeah. bit? <laughs> you, you, you try to zero in on people's symptoms and then, and then you accelerate that bitch. Yep. And that brings. But I, that, I would say, yeah, I would say. Look, cures that. It, well, it doesn't. The idea of a cure in, in, involves a finite point, right? So the idea is, oh, once. A cure says, okay, this is the finite point. What I say is it's a new proposal for an end game in psychotherapy. Whoa. So the, so wow. it's the process is this is the end game of psychotherapy, which is not the end game of human existence. I see. So that's a bit, that's different. So like, so psychotherapy, the end game is, so now that's in brought into consciousness. Now, now there's, you can see how it contradicts maybe your immediate, events when you're dealing with and you have to now you can sort with that information and then um psychotherapy psychotherapy ends right i don't like the idea that you know and this is lacan as well it's like that a therapist plays a role in attachment like humanist theory or later freudians is like it's not good because ultimately they leave the room the room shouldn't perpetuate itself is one of my beliefs is the room should be designed to self-destruct um in that um, the therapy, like one of the chapters is pass itself, in that you give, you give somebody um, something that is greater than the process of psychotherapy itself. Where people be like, yeah, I talked to my therapist and I felt really good. It's like, well, great. Um, <laughs> who cares? <laughs> like you feel good and then it feels good to feel good, but it needs to surpass itself in that it has to, you give somebody themselves so that the therapy process ultimately isn't the self-perpetuating feedback loop, which is, I think, what you could criticize Freud for, but also he started psychoanalysis, so he sort of had to. But it, it fed into itself. Psychoanalysis, the signifier, fed into the process of psychoanalysis as a good, whereas I'm breaking sort of past that and saying psychotherapy is a, sort of a machinic process. And, um, it, and then the subject, the therapeutic subject, 
eventually goes outside of this machine. So they enter the machine, then they exit the machine. Right. Right. Okay, that's interesting. How much do you know about uh, Felix Guattari and his experiments? I don't, you know, I don't, I know, I know, I read, I've, I've read it. I'm not a, I wouldn't say I'm not like a schizoanalysis expert. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I know, I know about the theories and I know about um, the systemic processes and especially how it relates to accelerationism. But in terms of Guattari specifically and his sort of specific experiments, I know, I, he was, I know he, he sort of tried to f free up desire flows, which I think was like a direct, um, counter to freud but it's like you almost got it that's almost the wrong part of freud to look at because you you take the signifier freud <laughs> like what do you mean by that do you mean like you mean like your mom jokes um but you if you take the signifier freud and you extract out of it psychopathology of everyday life which is the signifiers then you get what i'm sort of talking about which is how do signifiers relate to each other what are the sort of unconscious implications why does one sentence follow the next sentence and the idea is there's a link there's a deep link there's like a deep learning link so that's what's interesting about freud to me um hmm. yeah okay in terms of the idea of oh desire is everything it's like well sure but that's a signifier it's like what do you mean by that right and then i think they you know deleuze and Guattari did a good job of showing you know the machinic process or what it, what it could look like if you didn't create uh, you know the inside and the outside and you sort of looked at stuff as systems as sort of flows and as sort of um you know <laughs> fields right. i suppose right right do you, now do you think the idea this kind of freudian meme of the the significance of sexual dynamics between parents and children is that overrated or underrated it's almost like it's it's almost um I would almost say it's a distraction more than anything. So that's um, not really that relevant to you. Um, I would say it's relevant in that the name of the father is relevant in like Lacanian theory in terms of like the Oedipal dynamic. It's like, I don't know. The way I always thought of it is, and I think I'm not, it's, it's not exactly a new thing to criticize Freud, right? But it's like, you know, Freud had a specific household where his mother was the same age as his uh, siblings and the father was the head of the house and sort of ruled the house with an iron fist and maybe wanted to kill him you know <laughs> yeah and uh, it was yeah very odd dynamic so um but you know that's that's nothing new i think maybe men tend tend to be more aggressive towards men because is or if you're a straight male you're more aggressive to straight men maybe or if you're and then more you know you genuinely kinder to women it could be possible or the opposite could be possible. See, that's the problem with it is you have to sort of, right. you have to be yeah, a signifier as a signifier, you know, and it's like, what's the essential quality that it's referring to, right? right. So desire and then death drive, I suppose. And then towards, so, you know. I, I have a question for you. Lacan was a Catholic, right? Yeah, he was. And I, I mean, a lot of these themes are kind of quite obviously kind of Christian inflected. Do you find that interesting? I mean, I find it kind of interesting that the you could interpret this idea of the name of the father, just taking one example that we've discussed, as a kind of psychological basis for saying that, you know, a, perhaps a belief in God is uh, an appropriate kind of justified, uh, you know, belief if, in fact, we have these kind of deep psychological structures that require us to have uh, the name of some father to kind of hold our symbolic orders um together right like maybe re religion in some sense in particular christianity and maybe even in particular catholicism kind of represents this edifice that's quite like psychologically well engineered perhaps yeah do you think well, about lacan, that or no? yeah well lacan's use of those things the, th the other book he says are important he says inter the three important freud books really are interpretation of dreams psychopathology of everyday life and the jokes book Mm -hmm. No one reads the jokes book, but why the jokes book is because the name of, when you condense when you take like a really big idea and you condense it to gnome de pair and then the non dupe airs the not like it's that's not intrinsically part of the language as Freud might you know like parse out and see if it is or isn't but the the idea is you you get a lot uh you know the limits of his language uh are not limited by 
by by simple by everything being spelled out. So the name of the Father, you know, brings into mind uh, I would say God and that sort of things, and maybe it brings in different stuff uh, for you than it would for me because mm-hmm. you have that Catholic connection with Lacan that I don't that I that I don't me over mm-hmm. here with my with my menorah. My Spinoza. <laughs> well, <laughs> like you, yeah, but you, can, have, right? you know, you can easily find kind of Jewish equivalents to what I'm saying. You know. Yeah, it could. Well, no, no, <laughs> you, no, you can't. Well, I think um, about I think about like the history of kind of Jewish monotheism, especially negative yeah. negative theology. I mean, this idea that God is this kind of unknowable placeholder. You know that I think is, that's true. Is, yes, it's very is very kind of Lacanian. But if you look into the Christ. Um, uh, Christ as a person or as a manifestation of a uh, God, I would say uh, my my like hottest take, which is like unnecessary blasphemy against Christianity, is like it's like well, it's uh, I'll just this is the place. So yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely uh, is like so you know no idols. So it's only it's pure spirit. So Judaism is sort of pure Holy Spirit, right? Right. And so Christ becomes a physical manifestation, or you could look at it as a as an idol and it becomes like it's almost like anti like my sort of joke to myself is like it's almost anti jordan peterson it's like well that's compelled speech eh (laughs) here you have be nice to your neighbor why do i have to be nice to my neighbor eh right but versus like don't kill don't do this don't do this and then okay go ahead right i mean (laughs) yeah so it's different it's yeah yeah. it's fascinating i mean one way I, i tend to see religions is basically they are multiple different attempts to do uh, basically similar things. And they're just, they're, they're conditioned by, you know, the contingent factors of their time and place at which they kind of emerged and evolved. And so like- The beautiful part is they don't, they don't do the same thing, even if they try to do the same thing because the structure is different. Sure. But you get thrown into a different set of machinery, right? A system, you know? So it's like I, me and you switch places uh, and if I was thrown through the Catholic machinery and you were thrown through the Jewish machinery in terms of birth and then you say you got a bar, bar mitzvah that, you know, you went through, the, you had, <laughs> you, you turn out maybe to be a different, a uh, different person, you know? Right, right. No, that's a, that's a fair, perfectly fine point. I guess I'm just thinking that just to take this example that we're working with, uh, the, this idea of the name of the father, like if Lacan is right and there is this kind of deep psychological structure in which human beings have this symbolic order that has a strong tendency to constantly be in play and in flux. And if you don't mm-hmm. have some master signifiers or, you know, if you don't have a name of the father, like some, I think he also has this term of the, uh, what is it? The, the point de Capiton, is it? Yeah. The, the quilting point. Yeah, exactly. Right. So if yeah. you don't have these different, uh, if you don't have at least some specific elements in, in your kind of symbolic structure that are, yeah. are firmly pinned down in other words, that you go from exactly like honesty. Yeah, right. So yeah. if you don't have if you don't have at least some key points that are pinned down, then you really do have this major psychological risk of the whole web becoming out of control and 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 kind of constantly cycling in a in a pathological way or something like that. And so, yeah. you know, religion religion is obviously a complex kind of evolved phenomenon and so that means it it very likely is uh, is trying to serve a few different social functions at once probably. Um but just to take this one example mm-hmm. to, fi- to fix ideas, if this is one of the kind of psychological human challenges that if religions evolve to to serve or to adapt to, then you know Ju- Judaism, for instance, as you just kind of outlined it, it takes it takes a particular stab at the problem. You know what I mean? Like that that, that stab would be, as you said, kind of focusing on spirit, uh, really putting a lot of eggs in the basket of not falling into the trap of of idolization or over fixating on particular kind of authoritarian authoritarian structures or something like that whereas catholicism mm-hmm. takes a different stab at the same puzzle but there's variety now, in now justin here, here's something i think of did you, were jews persecuted because they were historically the first libertarians hmm. <laughs> yeah, well but they're all about like they're all about kind of state power and in, in, within their own system now it right? seems like it doesn't it now that we got israel well but, but even, historically, we... even historically right like the I mean, they're a good example of exit for sure, like libertarian exit ethos. Yeah, nomadic. They're nomadic, uh, you know, war machine. Yeah, they <laughs> exit over voice. I think yeah. for sure. Um, 
and but once that once they exit within their own domain, you know, they're all about state state power. I think historically, well, I think well, I think it happens um, that by not spelling out the sort of Christian ethos of it, sort of came out anyway. Mm. And I think um, maybe Christianity could have been a, a it's like oh let's get this in writing, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? Right. So, so right. They're very much about you know well secular you know secular Judaism, which most of it is, is you know love thy neighbor, help other people. Uh, be a good person, which is it's it's sort of abstractions that manifest it essentially in like uh, in the immediate and sort of liberal sort of political views. Although now it's even you know what's funny is even in right wing nationalism like um, like Israel, you you know you ask them they still think of themselves as like liberals. Hmm. And I've you know I've talked to you know I actually talked to someone who is in like the Israeli secret service who is in a who is in like a they 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 happen to become a therapist and they go well you know i got arrested for having two passports in lebanon i said why the fuck did you have two passports <laughs> <laughs> they, i was like were you like in secret service like were they i was like huh <laughs> wow like, oh. and then i was like well you must have been right <laughs> so i just sort of kept pressing them. and they're like well yeah but but they they thought of themselves as as liberal they thought of themselves as left wing despite working in this sort of nationalist machine so <laughs> there's right. there's a sort of there's that there's that idea that I guess maybe state power goes from we're going to help people and we're going to help people through the state and we're going to fight for good stuff through the state I suppose. Right. And maybe right. that's where it comes from. Well, to me kind of I think the genius of Catholicism is that the idea of kind of stabilizing and enforcing the name of the father is delegated to a kind of authoritarian agency. <laughs> uh, yeah. That, and I, and I'm, I, I'm quite attracted to that because in some sense, there is obviously uh, a major problem with all authoritarian structures, which is they tend towards, you know, tyranny and all kinds of perversion and unchecked uh, domination. But, but the, the kind of, I think the genius of Catholicism is that it is quite specifically circumscribed to to a very specific kind of spiritual domain. And so like you are giving and kind of uh, respecting the authority of the, the kind of unchecked authority of this, of this human institutional power, the Catholic mm -hmm. church to basically be the arbiter of, of, of one's kind of, uh, you know, symbolic order, if you will. Yeah. And, well, it's and, interesting and you, you, hmm. because the Catholic church changed. If you read um, Dante's De Monarchia, which is really interesting. Um, they didn't, they didn't, they weren't for the monarchy. Catholics were not for the monarchy because mm -hmm. they had city states. So the unchecked power was the power of the city state. And then the idea that it should all be, that should all come under one ruler because that's how God ruled his kingdom. So right. we should have on earth the way God ruled his kingdom in, in sort of the Bible. Right. And that was like a banned book for, by the, so it was anti-monarchy. What was the banned book? Uh, De Monarchia. Uh, by oh, Dante. Okay. okay, interesting, right? Yeah. So, and so but it's really yeah. interesting read uh, in terms of like a pro uh, a pro um, monarchy book. I would I would, re I would recommend it. Well, that's kind of what that's kind of what I'm getting at, which is that if you there's a genius in kind of deferring the enforcement of the symbolic order to an external agency, uh, yeah. because even though you're giving them kind of absolute power over your symbolic order, all you're really giving them power over is enforcing that name of the father. They, they just have the power over that, that, that quilt, the quilting points, basically they, they decide the quilting points, but then after you give, after you delegate that or accept, you know, the authority of that, of that power to, to basically decide and, and arbitrate the, the quilting points or the name of the father, then the entire political domain, the entire civic domain, the aesthetic and kind of creative domain, actually I think gets freed up and it gets, it gets liberated for experimentation as yeah. long as you respect Here's the one problem. quilting points. Here's one problem, Justin, with, with monarchy in the 21st century, say like a uh, neocameralism got established and there was a, like a monarch CEO. The problem is if you, if you also have, um, if you also have free media, people, the, the time where they use their absolute power to cut someone's head off or to fucking gut somebody or whatever. Um, and that comes up 
in front of people, there's the illusion of locality is conjured and they're, they're inflicted with this. And they go, this is happening right next to me by the person who is in charge of me. I don't like when people get killed. Oh no, this is, this is not good. So then if you look at sort of the absolute of where we are right now, which is, there is a, there's like the, the neo reaction revival and all those, and all the monarchy theory. And then also the hyper populism theory of, of, I would say of, of the left, but also of the, you know, the right libertarians, um, where because of technological accelerationism, we can acceleration, not accelerationism itself, but acceleration, these, these things can now feed back onto itself itself and become really developed. Like there's a Lord, there's a big monarchy Lord now. Um, and I think, and I think, um, how, how they ever get inputted into reality, you have to look at as a second thing. So then you have to look at what's it's like, well, where are the States right now? What are the actualities? Where are monarchies? Well, there's monarchies pretty much in the Middle East pretty much. And then I guess you could look at like a Middle Eastern monarchy is like the high end of the point in monarchy scale. And then you have like maybe China where it's like a secretary de facto monarch, but not quite because right. there's, there's some like checks and there's, they don't have that system of absolute monarchy in and of itself because it's, because the monarchy is good. Right. And then you sort of have countries with no States, like failed States like Libya. And, um, and you, you sort of have that continuum. And I think people, people n gravitate towards less violence. So it's like, which one causes less violence? And the problem with the idea of, of um, optimizing for intelligence like Nick Land wants to is that um, people don't like to watch people die, period. People don't like it. And, it, and the more it gets brought up in front of people's faces, the more the, their drive is against it. So you get these sort of like, okay, this is, this is where <laughs> we're, we're sort of creating a moral system in the US and we're sort of here right now. Like this is, the dialectic is still like sort of rumbling, but it's rumbling around a republic, right? Mm. So yeah. it's almost like to be a monarchy, you'd almost have to start from a monarchy, I would say. Like the, like I think Saudis are trying to do that. They're trying to, aren't they trying to create like a bubble, like a bubble state? And they're like trying to like recruit people like who are like I was like yeah, I'm not up enough on on all of that but I yeah, I know they're up to, they're up to all kinds of crazy shit <laughs> yeah like <laughs> that's where it's that's where it arrives from it arrives from itself you know things always arrive from themselves wow neo Saudi Arabia arrives from the future it arrives from itself man it arrives from itself but it also like if you look at like the time you know what's interesting about the concept of the future. The future is always the future. So the future was the future in the 40s, in the 30s, and the future is the future now. So, so that concept of the future, it never quite arrives because it's always in the future. So it's like what constitutes the future sort of constitutes itself, right? The intrinsic um, retrofuturism dynamic that Lan talks about in time complexity, uh, loops through Shanghai time. That's my favorite. Underrated land post, like B-side oh, yeah. land. B side land, time complexity, really good. <laughs> but yeah, he talks about that, that sort of dynamic. Right, yeah. right. But you know, there's also this idea that at a certain point, the difference between past and future can't really be distinguished. This idea of, you know, kind of the symmetry of, of, of time yeah. in some sense. And so it's like, that's why I'm very interested in these ideas around kind of super intelligence takeoff, because, you know, there are really high level rational super rationalist scientific and philosophical minds right now who are highly respected who take you know the prospect of some sort of super intelligence takeoff very very seriously yeah. uh for those of listening who don't know what i'm talking about basically just the idea that you know once machine intelligence becomes sufficiently recursive that is self-improving uh you know you could we can very well imagine all different types of uh kind of exponential spiraling scenarios like the ones outlined by someone like Nick Bostrom. And so this, this idea is taken very, very seriously that we could, we could quite suddenly sometime in the next hundred years, start kind of skyrocketing in, into a kind of intelligence escalation um, that, you know, that, that, that we might not even be able to make it out alive of, uh, make it, make it, make it out alive from or whatever. And so um, in some sense, 
like I see this as we are, we could very well be that's going into the future, right? But it might be, you know, it might very well be bringing us into the absolute past in the sense that, you know, in, you know, in the end is the beginning, this, this kind of idea or, or, or meme, mm. you know, because especially if you're like, um, if you think about like the creationist model of, of cosmology or whatever, um, you know, there's this idea that we were created by a, an intelligent creator, which for a while I didn't really believe it sounded kind of mystical and, and su superstitious. Like, why would there be some intelligent creator? But then you have people like Nick Bostrom teaching us that actually it's, it's quite rational to believe that one very possible scenario is that we are the simulation of, of a higher intelligence of, of some kind implicitly some kind of higher intelligence. Uh, and so if we are, if it's, if it's plausible rationally that we are in fact living in a simulation and it's possible that we are possibly spiraling into uh, a kind of escalating super intelligence uh, above and beyond kind of human carbon-based life forms. Well, then that sure as hell sounds to me like, you know, our future might be spiraling directly into our past, which is we will be meeting with the higher form of intelligence, uh, which is in fact our creator in some sense. In other words, yeah. the, our creator or, or our past, the, the, the conditions for our emergence as humans in the past, what caused us in some sense might be precisely uh, what we are headed to. Yeah, well, systemically, to what link would we have to that higher creator? Uh, would be the question. Assuming it, it is true, uh, what 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 would be the extent of the connection? Because we do it, we are sort of finite nodes oh, of this sorry. universal. <laughs> My battery's about to die. I oh, it. gotcha. That would have been bad. That'd be, the, that'd be the first time that ever happened. Uh, but I caught it. But yeah, you know that idea of 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 um, monotheism being correct is, a, is an interesting one. And correct is a super intelligence uh, creationist theory. Uh, I think if that was true, the question would be like, I, you know, like I just said is to what extent are we connected? Would be, would be, would they have access to us almost in total? And then the other, a you know, the other aspect of, of it would be to what extent is, uh, does it have control over the realm or whatever? And I think a nice narcissist, I think partly I try to try to ascribe that the truth value of false um, because, I, you know, I, I like to fill out algorithms. So I think if you ascribe, if you ascribe it as true um, and you logically follow it, it, it leads to pretty much, you can get like, you can get pretty psychotic pretty quickly, I would say, in terms of like, this is happening because of this is happening. But, you know, I give myself a little treat sometimes and I'll like ascribe it the truth value of true. Just like briefly in like a narcissistic moment, maybe, and uh, <laughs> I'll go like uh, I'll say to you know like a like a client they're going through a lot and they're like and they're doing this and this is happening and then you know it's like and I just said I said and it's like what would if there was a god you know it's like what would they be doing for me and then you know my my nice narcissistic thought was of course some, something along the lines of they brought you here. To, to the greatest psychotherapist in the world. Of Wait, so course. you're saying <laughs> you're you're saying that assigning truth value to what leads to, to God being true? To God, so oh. like a creator being true. So assigning yes. that in terms of one and zero versus false or true, which is sort of like how I like to you know break it down. Let's break it down like that. So if it's true and we run with that in terms of a logic. Uh -huh. And we allow that logic to keep going. That's like me and you, we were brought here for a reason. For Like if we were to say Spinoza and pantheism, let me just crank that to true really quickly. Is like God brought me here in front of you and you're in front of me and we're figuring something out and we're working out a contradiction within which is within God himself through our finite selves, which are not God, but God has access to us, right? Okay. So like the logic, you can follow logic based on these binaries. But do you think assigning truth value to God that leads to psychotic outcomes, or is does it actually lead to quite adaptive outcomes that actually help people in most ways? Because oh, very adaptive. I would say for me it would. <laughs> for for me, if I just like a for for because I'm like very like I follow the algorithm. I follow my nose. So, you know, if I if I was to click God to just sort of true 
and just say everything is predestined, you know, and you look for the reason, that's sort of the structure of psychosis a little bit, which is, okay. which is everything has an intrinsic reason behind it. And I just need to find the meaning. It's like, here's the meaning that was given to me. Here's the meaning. It's like, what's the meaning of this? So if you're looking, that's, that's sort of the base system of um, paranoid psychosis. So to me, actually, I feel like Protestantism is uniquely susceptible to that problem precisely yeah. because there's no kind of higher authoritarian structure to place kind of enforce the limits on it. So you have this kind of explosion of Protestant sects and denominations. And like if, 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 if Christians can basically have a personal relationship with Jesus, that does lead to like a really kind of wild psychotic kind of cycling. Like you can, you can see the history of just the explosion of Protestant denominations you can see that as kind of playing out this like psychotic uh, outcome that that you're describing because yeah. you know, the problem there is that there is no way to pin down um, like particular quilting points for you know there, there's a potentially infinite variety of of Christianities if you don't have some sort of uh, authority structure. So in some sense, I think the genius of Catholicism again is like it, it's it's a kind of social technology for preventing this kind of psychotic break that can come from religious belief. Yeah, there you go. That's a great way to put it. Social technology. That's like creating a quilting point. It's like you don't have you don't have Spinoza and pantheism, which is um, God is everything that is happening is a conflict being worked out in God himself, which is that which is that's what I like to think of because that's Hegel. That's where Hegel worked from. Mm. Okay, so I feel like we should shift gears a little bit because I've been uh, ranting enough about Catholicism. I've probably lost a few atheistic uh, heathen <laughs> listeners. So, uh, if you're out there and you're getting bored of my ca- Catholic rantings, uh, don't worry, we're going to change gears now. That's what, I love that part of Twitter. It's like, uh, it's so wild that these like parts are springing up. Oh, I think know? it's, yeah, so wild and interesting and cool. You know, hence yeah. my doing this, but here's a question for you, Elliot. Do you have a take on kind of the current left wing kind of political correctness hysteria from a kind of psycho therapeutic perspective in, in the sense that like, do you have a diagnosis for the kind of contemporary social justice warrior in your in your framework? How would you describe that psychological? Just look at it through egoism. I Say almost you just you go back to egoism, which is here are some qualities of myself, and I can ascribe to them as intrinsically good. Okay, great. So, if I was to do that with Judaism, you could do that with Judaism, and you could sort of feed back into that. But um, the social, I would say, the machinery. Um, which is sort of the the politics of, I would guess, equality, and then that sort of machine keeps going in terms of the the American racial divide, which was you know goes from slavery to segregation uh, to equal rights, uh, and then you know stuff like that, and socially culture. The machine's just still going. It's just still going. It's still in reaction. It's still like it's still being slingshotted. So those tensions are still sort of being worked out. And I think um, people are just feed, feeding into those absolute values that are their sort of own identity, right? Whereas, um, and there's also, there's also systemic places like, you know, where I, where I uh, sort of work, it, you know, the question is like, if you go to like the school around there, the question isn't like, what race are you? The question is almost like, are you black or are you Hispanic? And those are the those are the two tensions, and they you know there's a lot of there's a lot of fighting, um, and that's because that sort of carries with it the machinery of segregation, which was already present in um, Los Angeles, and it's still reeling from that. And it's like now that there's now that segregation isn't a policy, uh, people haven't left um, their their sort of structures. They like okay, this is no longer mandatory. But what's so interesting about positive feedback loops um, is once you take you, you have a law, and then you remove the law, and it's fed back onto itself in so many different ways. People are still staying in those places, <laughs> like, and it, it's still, like, reeling. People are still reeling from it. Um, okay. So in terms of some, somebody getting more, like, more value from themselves, they, have, they already have the machinery. They have the social technology of, say, like, black empowerment, uh, brown power, stuff like that. Um, the machinery is there, and it's very complex because it's it's um, still moving from the civil rights era, and it has this sort of moral register of like goodness, despite it maybe 
seeing like, hey, this doesn't have um, maybe in and for itself a very logical outcome, which is sort of when you get down to it, sort of ethno nationalism. <laughs> um, but okay, so yeah, you're kind of saying that, if I understand you correctly, you're saying that there are these kind of inherited symbolic structures that have, uh, you know, kind of positive connotations of liberation or whatever. Um, and they're getting basically kind of uh, filtered into sub subjective identity investments in pathological ways. Is that something? I'm not saying thinking? pathological because pathological implies that it's abnormal versus systemically it's happening, right? <laughs> so it's like, it's not, you can't quite call it pathological because it's, it's like, it's like, would you call someone going on the top of the slide? It's like, they're going to come out of the bottom of the slide. It's like they're they're out on the bottom of the slide. It's like how pathological they're on the bottom of the slide. It's like well, they didn't really have a choice almost. It's like okay, they're, I, they're people people are fed through the machinery that they're fed through. Um, in terms of people's ability to break out of that machinery, I think people have to be given a better option. So it, you're not gonna you're not gonna tell somebody to stop to to be who's like really invested in like I'd Paul and like um the, those sort of politics unless you give them an option that is more appealing to them and works better in their social machinery than where they already are. So if um, identity but I, politics- But I've already given them a better option, which is hanging out with me on YouTube and not all of them want to do it. So- But that's, but that's the thing is that might not be a better option for you know, a lot of people. Blasphemy, of course it is. <laughs> in, with their uh -huh. material social machinery, like keep in mind, you're like there. If they were like maybe in the, you know, you know, in like the UK, they would like go and they would go and like hang out and they would be like, oh, yeah, this is this is kind of cool. It's like, you know, there's the coffee shop here and everyone's like, you know, they're in identity politics. But then there's there's Justin's like, uh, I don't know, heroin and smoothie bar here. And you can go, go hang out in Justin's heroin and smoothie bar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This social machine is great. Uh, uh, they're open late on on Tuesdays or whatever. <laughs> right. So it's like the machinery is important. So it's right. not just the ideas in and for themselves. It's. That's why my show with Dr. Bones is egoism in the absolute is how does how does egoism and self interest relate to these overarching uh, mechanisms and machines? Yeah, I talked to Dr. Bones last week. Interesting cat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We're very so, different. What's that? Interesting. We're very different, me and him, huh? Yeah, I definitely. Say. Yeah. But we but we, we we come together on the idea of egoism. So then we sort of flesh out. It's like, how does egoism relate to all these different things? Okay, right, right. Cool. So, I mean, your points are well taken on, on, on my question before your points are well taken, but there's something kind of unsatisfying about your response, which is I'm, I'm just trying to zero in. I'm just trying to zero in on <laughs> clearly there are certain forms of highly visible kind of hysterical to use a somewhat psychoanalytic word, to use it in a non-technical sense, but there, there are, there are certain forms of high, high visibility, uh, kind of hist hysterical, like particularly hysterical behaviors that you can now find uh, in the media today that are that are quite fashionable to some degree even. Among... Well, you just answered your own question. Go on. It's quite fashionable. Is that just, that's your only explanation? You don't have a kind of psychological take on it? A psychological take, like, is not separate from the actual explanation. <laughs> like, I'm yeah, not sure. Like, yeah. The idea, yeah. Like, sure. um, yeah, I, so people people get, you get enjoyment and you get integration into the symbolic order. It's you don't have they don't have Catholicism or whatever, they don't have you know a monarchy. They have their symbolic order. They have say you, you know, you go to like UCLA or whatever, and you a lot of people go into like regular Democrat politics from UCLA, and it's kind of boring. They I think they kind of have a sense that it's boring and stupid, and then they they but because they get to be in charge of something, they like they you know they enjoy it and they become Democrats. They become the LA Democrats. And they're just, they're just, they're going through the machinery and, you know, getting their, you know, enjoyment. So the, the, the psychological explanation I have is psychological egoism, which means people will always act in their self-interest period. Um, people are not singular monoliths, but they're different systems negotiating what is their self-interest and you can't escape that. Okay. No, that's fair enough. I, I get your perspective and that that's makes enough sense to me for sure. I, I was just curious if you had any kind of insight. Uh, so here we so here here we go though this is it's like well how do we I think one of the questions you might be interested in so what do we do about it how do we fix this and I think one of the is like eventually it becomes self-directing um, in that 
if if psychological egoism is true, and the beautiful thing, Justin, is that it is true. So people will work in their self interest. So if you can, if you can align their self interest away from, say, like a certain politic, you, but you'd actually have to really do that. You'd really have to understand a person, and you would have to give them a better alternative. And right, you, which and is you have to, and you have to work from their sort of system, not your system. You yeah, can't I mean, just integrate them into your system. You have to sort of like build build their system. Right? Yeah, I mean, no joke. That's actually one of the main things I am genuinely trying to do. Yeah, so that's that's what you got to do. Is you got to work from psycho, you know, their self interest, and you got to work from their system, not just right. integration into a different system. Right. Well, there's something that which is like you know, pull. You could directly yank someone out of the system, and that's like. The revolutionary proposal, you know, but maybe give them give them a bridge, make it easy. Why not? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the bridge is that I do still talk with people that are kind of norm normy leftists, and yeah. so, like, I have no, I have nothing against normy leftists. If they want to talk to me, I'm I'm happy to talk with them, and so, and I do have people on the show who still who, who are kind of in that world, and so that's like my olive branch. That's my olive branch. Like, I I got nothing but love for people, even people like who would like shit on me and, and kind of dishonor my name behind my back and stuff like that in all kinds of treacherous ways. Like even those people, I understand why they're doing it. I got nothing but love for them still. Um, and that's my, that's my tactic for trying to make this like, um, more living, autonomous, affirmative, uh, ac accelerationist kind of radical cultural sphere that we're all, you know, people like you and me are kind of swirling around in. Um, mm -hmm. to make it kind of an open membrane with the pockets of the contemporary left that I think are most regressive and 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 pathological. But that's why I'm kind of mining you for for psychological insights since you're a psychotherapist. Yeah, why not? Well, th that's what I, I mean. The whole idea of this book <laughs> is the integration of the actual, right? How do you integrate these? Um, these concepts into into psychotherapy, right? And how do you how do you build on people's values? And how do you how how would you bring that into event? And it sounds like you're sort of working through. It's like, well, I talk with these people through events, and that's that's sort of the the specific finite event is talking to talking to leftists. But maybe maybe you'll find you'll probably find a more even more efficient way and a more efficient way and continue to I don't know right perpetuate that. So I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I, I want to try rephrasing my question one more time on just on the last point, because everything you're saying makes makes sense enough. I'm not uh, pushing back against it, but I suspect that, you know, with your expertise, you, you I suspect there's a little bit more hiding there that you can contribute to helping us understand this particular puzzle of the social justice warrior, which is one of my kind of current kind of analytical fixations, just really trying to figure it out in, in a really rigorous way, like okay. what exactly... Is going I'm, gonna try to, I'm gonna really try to give you what you want, Justin. Sure. Which so, is which is a pol with is which is a pathology. You want you want a pathology. I, I so just want to hear. reframe it. I'm gonna reframe it a little okay. bit. Okay. Reframe, reframe. Which is what do you make of somebody who insists on a politic which has clear fallacies in it, which has has contradictions which are so apparent that the whole thing sort of should fall apart good but it doesn't good yes what do you make of that. that person it's you know that's 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 standard that's like a neurosis is you're fixated on a singular thing it doesn't matter the internal contradiction the internal contradiction has no relevance because a neurosis is the idea of the singular sort of fixation so you're singularly fixed on this idea and nothing else sort of matters there's no humanism doesn't enter there truth doesn't enter there Nothing enters there. It's a it's a self-contained neurotic system, and it, it's held together with aggression and and eros, and everything sort of gets fed into that neurosis, right? So that's you know I don't like to say SJW because I kind of you know it, it can be it can be abused, and it's also it's sure. like a cheap it's 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 a cheap term. I don't like it. Yeah, sure. And people, and social justice is you know it's good to have social justice to some extent, right? Depends on what you mean by social justice. Sure. And you could call me like a social justice cleric. I don't know, but the point point would be like, well, I think what you're looking for is when you get frustrated when you when you see these fallacies, and you say, "What's your problem?" You and you're like, "And I hate it because it's directed at me and it's in my face and 
and it's bad logic and I and like just be just you know just think of other things that are better or or like at least integrate your own contradictions in a logic way but they don't right and that's the nature of a sub obsessional neurosis you know so you okay. could call it hysteric but it's more like obsessional because it's it's a it's a feeding into that into in and of itself this is this is a good idea like or whatever whatever the political fixation is okay right? that's that's much closer to what i was imagining a psychotherapist such as yourself might be able to contribute to to the to the question so that's interesting so if i understand you correctly you're kind of saying that the oh by the way i don't really like the word social justice warrior either the term uh i just don't know of a better catchier one you know if you give me like something as short and easy to say as sjw that is like better i would gladly take it it's just what's emerged as like a vocabulary focal point in any event yeah okay yeah <laughs> um I'm, I'm seriously very but i knew uh, what you were saying when you said it What's that? So I could say it in other ways, which would be less, I guess, less, have less broader effects or whatever. Like you could say the ramifications of, you know, the sort of social politic or whatever that doesn't take into account material conditions, right? <laughs> but that, but when you say SJW, even though I'm like, I, I wouldn't say SJW, it's like, I knew it worked immediately and I knew what you were saying. Yeah, exactly. It, but it's, it but in and of itself, that word is like, like you like you uh, look at the virus the it's a pure y it's pure y virus you don't you don't if you if you're living in x virus world you can't <laughs> you can't be going like sjw this sjw you have to articulate it more i get but that. It, it takes yeah. away that heuristic so now i so you can you can use it i would say i would not use it right that's fair enough and yeah. i totally understand that <laughs> i was just explaining that yeah, a lot of people think that anyone who uses that word is just like signaling their kind of like right wing credibility. And uh, un unfortunately, I understand that perception, but it it is basically just the quickest, easiest way to describe a phenomenon. And so I've I've kind of taken it on for that reason. But um, I was just clarifying that I neither I have the same kind of sympathies as you do. Like I, I don't use that word actually to to dog whistle like right wing shit or to you know I I also think social justice is a is at least a laudable. Uh, idea is anyway. that not what you're trying to do with the monarchy what the, monarchy? Social the monarchy the catholic monarchy if you're like if you're like say you're a monarchist wouldn't you, wouldn't you wouldn't you agree that you're sort of like <laughs> that's like that's your form of social justice is you have this monarch is the quilt quilting point and you have a sense of rationality and you have it's integrated with you know god and law and so that would be the, the just social order but of course, but I know that that's playing with the words and that's not what right. I mean. But I'm, so not a monarchist. To I'm not a monarchist. I'm more into this idea of uh, a technological communist neo-feudalism, which is not monarchy. Neo-feudalism. Uh, yeah. What do you mean by neo-feudalism, by the way? Because I think I saw people, people were upset about that. People don't like Yeah, I know. I don't know why that. people were so upset about that. It's a pretty simple idea. It's kind of just like the idea of the model of the feudal manor, but with the internet, basically, <laughs> digital. It's a digitalized manner model, basically, is what I'm interested in. So basically, it involves using blockchain and AI to have a rigorously enforced autonomous communist system that, that basically kind of operates in a similar way as the, the traditional feudal manner, but is updated for the 21st century. It's the basic TLDR. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think people don't like because communism is specifically against the signifier of feudalism. Right. Yeah, but that's just a stupid, like, inherited meme. People got to get over that shit. Okay. No, I think the real, <laughs> the real, the real reason people don't like that idea, I realize, is because it is actually a possibly workable system in which a group of people can inf can can actually prevent each other from engaging in bad behaviors. But people like engaging in bad behaviors. People are addicted to their own sinfulness. So any type of political proposal in which someone could actually engineer a a, a project in which you're you're really not able to get away with lies and deception and dishonorable activities. Of course, people rebel against that because they want the right to engage in dishonor dishonorable activities. It's that simple. So you should love Facebook then. What's that? Don't you love Facebook then? Because Facebook makes you do that. No, Facebook, have... Facebook is a cesspool of dishonorable <laughs> activities. But you, have your, but you have your face and your name. Yeah, but there's not enough uh, enforcement of good behavior at all. We need we need way more enforcement of good behavior. But what we need is 
it executed in uh, kind of democratically, autonomously engineered ways. That's the key upshot of, of or defensible point of my of my model. It does sound a bit tyrannical, but the the, the key catch is that everyone voluntarily vo everyone voluntarily agrees to what the rules are. So you, it's basically the Rousseauian idea of, of the general will. Like we have to force each other to be free, and that's a fact. That's a fact of political life. I think uh, freedom is submission to the truth of the collective will. The problem historically is that particular parties get to get to decide and enforce what that general will is. And then it always veers off into tyranny and, and perversion of the truth. But with smart contracts and blockchain, we now have the possibility to program in a rigorous way, precisely what everyone in the group desires and agrees to. And then we can have machines that are more rigorous and objective than we are, enforce that for us passively. And so how would they enforce that on 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 say like a, a the internet you said? So well, it, it, it's better to think of it as a kind of uh, local intranet would be like a better way to think about. It. Of course, it can be connected to the to the wider internet, but um, to fix ideas and to imagine what I'm what I'm proposing here, mm -hmm. um, it basically would involve a large number of passive monitoring devices. So the the compound or the commune or whatever you want to call it, the commune is the bet the better way to put it, or the manor if you prefer that feudal terminology would be basically loaded up with a variety of different uh, passive sensing technologies in the background. So voice, speech, uh, different types of, um, you know, air conditions, whatever, like anything that is relevant to making inferences about what people are doing in the space would be passively monitored in the background. So it wouldn't require any work. It would all be automated. Um, the fully automated luxury communism is what I'm basically so uh, Justin, en engineering. I hate, I, I hate to do it to you. Go ahead. But you are, you are, you are really working through the honesty signifier that we talked about at the very beginning. Okay. And th this is the ultimate form. Like yes, you're continuing, yes, exactly. you're, you're the most devoted to the, to the honesty signifier. Yes. The issue is what is actually present. In, in people and what they so so yes. you're working out the idea is if you optimize for honesty that's right yeah that's which exactly is right. i'm not yeah so to me, i'm to not me, like yeah. the, the major failure mode of the whole history of radical leftism in one way or another all of the failures that recur throughout history boil down to some form of lying i i, I think basically deception basically and uh if we have rigorous autonomously controlled technological mechanisms for the prevention of dishonesty, betrayal, deception, then the dream of communism can be finally realized. But the reason why people rebel against my proposal, including many people who profess to be radical leftists or communists, is because they're not actual communists. What they want is the freedom to tell lies to themselves and to the other to others. And they're absolutely people are absolutely addicted to that quote unquote freedom, which is obviously just a false freedom. It's just liberty to, to be sinful and slothful, people are addicted to that. And the idea that some proposal might take it away from them, uh, everyone will immediately say, no, 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 we don't want that. Well, I say to you, then therefore you don't want the truth. You don't want uh, communism and you don't want uh, liberation. What's interesting is you're going to run up against the problem, which is language that refers to multiple sort of things and negative language and absent you'd get in a Zizek, um, what is the essential thing that you're, you're trying to do? So honesty in and of itself, I guess, is the most important thing, right? So then any, any sort of system that, that um, acquire, acquires sort of <laughs> autonomous control, I guess, eventually would have to deal with that it's a universal idea, absolute, which is honesty, and then how does that mani manifest in um, in reality? So we talk about the signifier SJW, right? It's like, well, I don't like to use that signifier SJW. One, because it's it's kind of abstract. It kind of like is an insult to people, I think, maybe that are doing good work and they don't like it. So like sort of in solidarity with them. But could you say it's dishonest of me to not say SJW? You could. You could say that mm -hmm. just as much as you could say, I'm, it's honest because I'm I'm actually adhering to this value set and these people that I'm trying to have solid some sort of solidarity with for you know ultimately my self interest because everything's in my self interest but I am trying to have solidarity with them and um, 
So at what point does lo will the logos fail? So I think some, a bug you would have to work out is how do you account for the failing of logos from the rule set to the finite um, actual actions, which are right. sort of almost be their actions that are sort of beyond language and what qualifies. And so that would have to be like intricately like right. decided. And eventually if you had a robot, if you had an artificial intelligence, they were making that decision. Um, I would say humans are already the most complex machines you have. So if I was like really trying to be like, like, you, you know, we got, we got a decision making machine given my RAM is way worse than like a, like a super powered computer. They were like, right. boom. <laughs> but I would like really try to figure out if it's like, okay, so Justin has this idea for honesty. This is the rule set. And then I'm, you know, I'm, I really study psychoanalytic Hegelianism and I like looked over and I'm like, okay, my only task is to make sure everybody's adhering to it. And then I would adhere every action to this. That's why I think the Ten Commandments are nice. To go back to Judaism for a second is because they're negative. Hmm. Like, don't right. have an idol. And right. Then, what, then you'd have to find out what qualifies as an idol. Does this, is this an idol? And then we'd have to define an idol, and then that would go further, and then we'd right. have to define that. Well, don't, you know, steal, don't covet. Oh, that's a tough one. Like, well, don't covet, like, say I like, uh, say I was like, damn, Justin has a sweet setup. Am I coveting? I would say, no, I mean, I don't think so. But I mean, to an AI, it might look like that. Right, right. So these are things I've actually thought about. And and your point about Judaism being ne mostly negative commandments is, is uh, apropos, because one of the things I've said in response to this critique is that one can be discreet and selective about what exactly is going to be monitored and enforced. So that's up to the creative will of the organization that is creating this system for itself. And what I would say is, just like you have different types of religions, there can be a, a, a wide variety of experiments around what parameters are going to be tracked and enforced. And, you know, you could have like a, 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 a Judaic kind of um, neo-feudal techno-communist patch in which uh, you only really try to set up a few minimal uh, prohibitions that are then, you know, on, you only enforce those prohibitions that you have a very high degree of confidence that you can accurately measure and, um, you know, and, and that you think like have relatively benign failure modes. Like you can, you can, you can do it in a, in a kind of discreet, careful way, or, you know, there might be more, um, more rigorous and, uh, conservative and, uh, how should I put it? Uh, authoritarian leaning types of people who want to take their chances with a more aggressive, authoritarian system that actually tries to track more, even though the the risks are greater, you know, you could have basically what I'm, what I'm saying is this is up mm. to the will of the people and uh, it can be done experimentally over time. We'll iter yeah. we'll, iter we'll iterate and people until love the idea of freedom though. They're like, the idea of freedom is so powerful. Like it's almost a cheat. It's almost like a low blow to say to like these libertarian projects to, to say like, well, that's not going to happen. It's, it's like, it's almost irrelevant. Cause it's like, maybe, maybe someone will set it up. Um, <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, it's almost like, it's like Neo, like imagine if I argued against neo cameralism and I said, neo cameralism is bad because no one will ever, it won't work. Like, well, <laughs> because no one will agree. It's like, well, maybe someone will agree. You know, maybe they could set up, someone could set up a, like a city state. Yeah. And that would be, oh. that would be, that would be interesting. Well, I almost, yeah. you know, I almost tried to run my, my Facebook group which is sort of like was originally just like for, for I like to post like, I don't know. It's not even mine anymore. I created a machine and the machine has surpassed me to some degree, but I've always maintained like autonomous uh, control over it. And my explanation for everything is because it's sort of my will because it's my, because it's my property. I created it. <laughs> so that's, that's why, of, you know, kind of like my discord server. Yeah. And, um, a lot of people didn't like it. <laughs> like oh, I was I like, so, yeah, but um, eventually what happened was like I, I removed myself from any sort of like deciding what is good. This is good. This is not good content. This is good content. This is not good content. And people would flood into the signifier Freud. So Freud brought its own sort of stuff, which I, which I can't get rid of. Uh, so so you're, you're starting with Freud. You're going to get like mom jokes, right? But then, but then I removed myself 
And what I found was so interesting is people kept, even after I was sort of like working through I, some ideas, some people like stuck on some of the ideas that I was like working through and like were really like about like specific techniques or specific. So in terms of like, in terms of a monarchy, like a techno monarchy, it would be, I guess it would, it would be so difficult to look at like all the, all the finite stuff and decide whether or not it like followed the rule set. You well, know? <laughs> but I'm not. Talking, but I have to remind you, I'm not talking about monarchy. I'm talking about distributed absolutism. Distributed, okay. Which that's is, well, that's interesting. But it's the computer is the is the decider, correct? Yeah, they're, they're basically super intelligence is enforcing everything, but it's in a distributed way that everyone voluntarily buys into. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I think it has potential, and then maybe if somebody does something, they exit. They have exactly. like an evi- like an evi- like an like an eviction notice, right? That's my other major defense for why this is clearly not fascistic at all, which is anyone can just leave when they want. <laughs> yeah, but then there would also have to be an eviction notice agreement, right? So it's like you have, you've not followed the rules. But like, man, I really like it here. This doesn't count. And then there would be there would that be that fight, and then how do you like when there's no, like fighting? No, so this is what's so cool about smart contracts is there would be no fight. It's all code. It's all code. So either ob- objective conditions are met or they're not, and it's triggered whether we like it or not. So there is no voice. There's no debate. Does this happen in meat space, Justin, or does this happen only on the net? Well, the idea is that um, all of the movement of, of, of money, basically, rewards, would be digital, uh, but there would be a kind of Internet of Things infrastructure for the monitoring and, and recording part. And then so people would live. All of the, like conduct of everyday life, which would be flourishing, basically, this would be the the final arrival of kind of the Marxist dream of absolute free time for everyone and unlimited creative human flourishing. That would be what most people would be would be doing during the day. This would just be the ba- the passive technological background that would make it possible. But I think the, the problem is, <laughs> is it's all serving the absolute of honesty. It's not serving. No, no, I would say that we suffer from a unique problem in kind of liberal modernity in which the freedom to lie has gone so rampantly wild that it's constant it constantly undercuts all efforts for humans to actually build meaningful positive liberating communities so i just see the problem of lying as a kind of major pitfall that the technology would solve but then the actual the actual values of the group, what people care about the most, what people choose to do, and what what's rallied around and what's produced, what emerges as the major values or goals, will be any number of other values or goals that are unique to the group in in question. So the honesty is just uh, to me the fi- fa- lying is one of the major failure modes of radical leftist politics. My idea is solve that rigorously, and then true values and true goals. But also uh, right wing politics too. What's that? Right wing. It's almost like a joke in right wing politics to lie. It's almost like part of the meme is like people in right wing politics tell a lie and everyone knows it's a lie and they laugh and then the left gets quote unquote triggered or whatever and then the right goes ha 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 ha. Right? I could see that. Yeah. Um, oh, I mean, man, I, I forgot what I was going to say. I was going to say something. It was really good. And then my psyche blocked it again. What? So that means it was good. It'll come back to you. Let's see. If what it's that was good. what? So what were I, you, you? You were just talking. The left and the right definitely both lie, no doubt. Uh, yeah. But I'm just talking specifically about the history of people trying to engineer collective liberation. I think basically the incentives to lie uh, have always been so strong and the technologies for preventing it have been relatively undeveloped. But now yeah. like cryptocurrency and blockchain is, as Nick Land says, it's a truth machine, essentially. That, and this, so- this is what I was going to say, I remembered. Sorry to interrupt, but I sure. remembered. It was the problem with it is telling like Jordan Peterson has a fatal flaw and he says, tell the truth. The problem is the truth is to find out the truth is really, really, really difficult and it's multiple Mm -hmm. and it's, and it's extensive. Mm -hmm. So the, which, which truths are you finding out and why? And you know, that the idea that truth telling is something people choose to do or not do, I think a lot of people can't. Um, they like literally quite. They quite literally can't because they they can't work out logical implications. 
of one thing to the next thing or their own ideas to themselves to the next thing. So, right. And then there's like people even who are like very smart who can't, you know, so it's not necessarily an IQ thing. It's like it's a neurosis and an inter- intrinsic contradiction thing. You're right? totally right. That's all true. But there are relatively discrete and easy to model cases of dishonesty that we can at least begin engineering rigorously. So for instance, you're right. Like what is the truth is it is a difficult, complicated question that we, it will be a long time before we have reliable algorithms to kind of get that for us. But it's important because let me just remind you that you said that honesty is like the most important and the lack of it. So it's like, this is a core contradiction. Like well, this is a problem to the model because because if you don't, if you, if honesty is something that's difficult and takes a long time, that means you have to have extensive, extensive logical sort of mechanisms for people themselves, not just the machine that decides, right? Well, I think you can be appropriately humble about what you just said and accept that honestly, and refuse to try to legislate or, or control that aspect of the truth or truth seeking that is, is beyond our ability to to fully grasp and also you know what? i just realized what you're doing you're creating god you're well, creating I god think, communities i think it's i think it's possible <laughs> i think it's possible that as i said the arrival yeah. of machine super intelligence on earth could it, it's it's quite rational and straightforward to interpret that as a kind of second coming of god so yeah, it's all like i'm a saying god community I'm not trying to create a God community. I'm saying if the arrival of machine superintelligence is basically the arrival of a kind of superpower of over and above human intelligence, we should submit ourselves to it in line with auto- autonomous, uh, democratic, communist desire is what I'm saying. I think, in other words, the second coming of God in the form of machine superintelligence is the final arrival of communism. It's it, there another way to put that is we should submit to it because it's our desire to. It is our desire to. What I'm saying, what I'm saying is, what I'm sketching with the the kind of uh, the, this proposed way to kind of organize or engineer our own cooperation with the arrival of machine superintelligence is I'm saying, you know, like we have to just accept. Um, this is accepting the 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 kind of uh the how should i put this the the kind of equivalence of communism intelligence and god they're kind of all one thing and they're arriving uh and so i'm always told to not communism non- intelligence and god all one that, thing and they're that's what i well that's what that, that's well, what i'm that's what i'm that's it that's a nice synthesis right there i mean i, <laughs> I mean not, you don't say synthesis exactly. i mean it's not <laughs> it's not that different than i mean this is basically just marx like this is straight out of marx basically Justin, my computer's about to die. I'm gonna do the same thing you did and grab my charger. Okay. I have like five minutes on this battery. Yeah, Patrick says you can be honest to the best of your ability. What I was gonna say, well, I won't say it because I'll wait for him to come back, but look, I know you can't model algorithmically like the whole truth. Uh, and it would be insane to try to do that with a automated system, but you can definitely break off pieces of the puzzle that are uh delimited and tractable such as for instance not lying not lying is a very different puzzle than finding the whole truth did you hear that elliot there there we go so what i was just saying is this is what i was trying to say before you jumped in front of me elliot which which is that i agree you can't model you're not going to like get the whole truth of existence with an algorithm but you can break off pieces of the puzzle that are tractable and delimited. So for instance, not lying, that's a very different puzzle and challenge than telling the whole truth, right? So you can start with, for instance, really objectively uh, easy to track, easy easy to measure, easy to, to limit questions about things that everyone in the group takes for granted as true. And then highly uh, easy to measure uh, forms of of speech or activity that count to everyone in the group as obvious uh, betrayals or, or deceptions of that fact um, can be counted as lies. And then everyone can agree to not tell those lies. That's that's like a tractable little delimitation of, of the, the truth puzzle that is absolutely engineerable, I think. Yeah. 
So that's what I'm getting. It, we can start with that. Yeah. So I would say that would be possible. And then the difficulty would be people to agree and buy into those things. I like what you said. So now we got now we got a proper Zizekian point. Now right, we got great. a proper Zizekian triad. Go for it. We have communism, intelligence, and God. Nice. Definitely. <laughs> communism feeds into intelligence, feeds into God, feeds into communism, and they all have their own sort of lineage that feed into each other. So that's your sort of, you have your feedback sort of, you have your, you have your Mobius strip there. My synthome. Well, no, your synthome, I would say, <laughs> I wouldn't say, maybe not, but I, I would say we took honesty, which is the synthome, right? Sort of the honesty. And we're weaving it. This is what I, it's all in the book, Justin. It's all in Zizek in the clinic. A revolutionary proposal. Is it backwards for you? It's backwards here. Zizek in the clinic, revolutionary proposal. 2019, I got an advanced copy. Wow, nice. Love Good plug, man. Me. Good plug. I was going to plug you at the end. Don't worry. Yeah, but um, that's the whole idea is you take the synthome and you weave it. So so you're, we you're already doing it, but then now you consciously were taking honesty and we're working through that with intelligence and the ideals of intelligence, which we haven't talked to because I know you have some um, controversial views. About intelligence, do I? No, I feel like no, my, maybe my you don't. Maybe. Are very mainstream, normal scientific views about intelligence. Right, fair enough. And then there's communism, mm -hmm. it's which great. has which has its notions of equality and democratic liberation. Yes, sort of internal liberation. Heck yeah. And then there's God. Yeah, good guy. God, the absolute. Recreating the absolute through through machine intelligence almost. That's why I like Spinoza and pantheism. Very useful for God. Yeah, Very me useful. too. I like it too. As a Catholic, I'm not supposed to like Spinoza and uh, pantheism, but my 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 mental model of the Catholic God is very similar to Spinoza and pantheism. I haven't worked that out fully, but that's my intuition. Yeah, well, it's the Holy Ghost. It's another way to look at it. Yeah, exactly. It's like yeah, working working through. It's something related to God working through itself. So there's, you could look at God the act. Like if I was to be a Catholic for a second, you have God the actor, the finite. Some somewhere there is a finite, infinite God who is also infinite through the Holy Ghost, and can expand. Say if we were a simulation throughout the whole simulation, and can. Like, but then he, there's like a zone where God would sort of collect uh, himself, itself, herself, whatever you want to do. Yeah, um, we, we would collect into a sort of finite, with infinite potentiality, right? And then yeah. you would have, then you would have the the sun or whatever, which would be another finite being, which God could link to or or give a certain amount of powers to, right? To distribute, uh, say like, oh, you could turn water into wine. You could do do stuff like that. So creating another finite being, which isn't quite God though, it wouldn't quite be God, right? True. So, so you can look at everything like a like a system. That's like, right. That's that's what I that's why I like to lose. Although I'm you know in terms of therapy, I don't like the fetishization of um, schizophrenia because people who deal with like I you know have to treat it and like people are in a lot of distress who are going through that. It's not like yeah. they're like having a good time through a field. Um, yeah, that was more Guattari. Deleuze did not like the fetishization of schizophrenics either. Oh, that's good. But um, the whole idea of no inside or outside um, and the idea that everything's sort of like a, sis a system or a smooth space where everything's sort of flowing and things sort of have linkages to each other, like the, like the Justin drug or the Elliot drug or caffeine functioning in the same way. That's how I, I like to think of, you know, you go to a restaurant and you're, you work just like a digestive system. You create, you exchange your, you exchange your capital for for food it looks like a reverse digestion system but it still yeah. works in the same way is you're feeding it the raw energy and you're getting you, you know this this machine creates uh, capital or it could create like your lungs create it's a way to capture oxygen just like a restaurant captures money right so everything works on this smooth i really like that because it, i think it's really true i have a question I, it, yeah 
Can I ask you a kind of random question, switching gears a little bit? Sure, I'm just going to spin my dreidel. Spin my fucking dreidel for a second. Yeah, go on. Are you literally, <laughs> are you literally spinning your dreidel? <laughs> nice. Yeah, go on. Go on, Justin. I really like how in this stream, even the way, <laughs> even the way that you've arranged your uh, backdrop, I like yeah. how you're uh, really trolling like any of the anti-Semitic people on YouTube. Well, it's funny because I actually am Jewish, and I didn't. I set this up here, but this would be set up here even if it wasn't Hanukkah. So <laughs> it, it happens that I'm trolling them with like my authentic, like this. I it, I didn't set it up for. The, I did think of that beforehand, though. I was like, oh, there could be some neo-reactionaries or anti-Semitic <laughs> on Justin. And here I have, it's like, here you go. Well, this is exactly what they want, too. They like a, they like a juice spinning a griddle, you know, or something. <laughs> That's hilarious. So you. it's like, yeah. Do you live with anyone? <laughs> yeah, my girlfriend is in there. Okay. You know, is she Jewish, yeah. too? No, she's, uh, she's uh, Mexican, uh, born Catholic, but oh. not practicing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Does she play with your dreidel, too? <laughs> Justin, that's crude. What a crude question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can I ask the question I wanted to ask you? Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I asked you like several months ago if you wanted uh -huh. to, to do a live stream. And mm -hmm. at that time, not to blow up your spot too much, you said mm -hmm. no. And mm -hmm. without, you know, blowing up your spot, you, you, gave, you gave me a little bit of an ind indication that at the time, I think one of the reasons you didn't want to do, have a live stream with me is because uh -huh. maybe the perception that my project is a little dicey politically. And uh, recent, it was only recently that you uh, you hit me up and you wanted to take me up on the offer. So I was yeah. just curious, I was curious what changed in your calculation. I thought of an idea and I thought you were the perfect person to talk to for it. And you know, I do, I do, you know, I do like it. I do like the show. Oh, like, I like, I, <laughs> so, and you know, I think um, part of it was, um, I was I was just trying to do very simple stuff. I'm like, okay, I have a uh, here. I have a job. Okay, it's cool to maintain. I'm gonna maintain my job. Right. And I have this book. Okay, I have this this book that got published. So what am I gonna do? Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna make sure nothing jeopardizes either. So I'm optimizing for that. So it's like not optimizing for my own personal enjoyment, which is here talking to Justin, spinning some dreidels pitching a book or whatever but <laughs> but i was optimizing for survival and now i'm like sort of like getting out of my shell a little bit i'm like having a good time and now i'm talking to you now i'm op optimizing for desire a little more okay. not that i did not that i desire you justin although you know very well-kempt man but i'm not that's not my cup of tea but, <laughs> but, <I'm, laughs> but I mean, no really like coming on here and talking and being a part of sort of um conversation here i was i was like because you can always just not be you could always just not be right yeah so i was like so the the question is to come out of nothingness into this system right so i was like i could always just stay in nothingness and you know that's fascinating just, that's an yeah. interesting way to describe it yeah was there was there something that triggered it or something yeah that... there was i had this idea um i was i was eating dinner with my girlfriend <laughs> And I was, I liked it because she's like, she's like liberal left, like liberal left, like not like edgy internet liberal left, like just left, just like a, an average, like a normie almost. Social not justice a normie. warrior. I know if, if you can hear me, you're not a normie. Oh, she, she heard that. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> she doesn't she, like when I call so her she's, normie. she's like a social justice <laughs> I don't. I don't. I really don't mean that in a bad way necessarily. Like it's it's a sociological. I, I, was, I would say she has she has traditional <laughs> viewpoints that one might as, associate with that. I mean, my wife is <laughs> my wife is basically kind of a social justice warrior, or she's That's interesting. She's moved away from it a bit, uh, but she's much more of. A, I, I tell people she's much more of a social justice warrior than I am. It's just a difference. So, uh, but but yeah, I mean, I I have friends who are social justice warriors. Like I get it. It's just it's it's a different viewpoint it's a different sociological uh uh type uh i think the extreme versions of it are quite reprehensible and and pathological but the extreme versions of any sociological type are often reprehensible and i, I don't charge everyone with guilt for that you know do you think sexual difference exists between men and women 
Is that a trick? Is that a joke? No, it's not. I'm like, I'm like, uh, that's the starting point. Do you think sexual? Oh, different? right. Yeah. That's, that's like a, that's a, that's a, what a, so what a quantitative social scientist might say. Uh, that well, has, no, no, I, but okay. Let me, let me give value. you a, a better question. Do you think the psychic structure of enjoyment between men and women are significantly different? I think the psychic structure of enjoyment is a little mm -hmm. woo woo for me, but okay. I think so let me, let me make it as specific as possible. Um, object oriented ontologists would say the realm of being or an essence is a, is a masculine sort of pursuit. Um, the realm of appearance or the, the things are the way they appear to be is the feminine mechanism. So to subvert, um, so then the Lacanian idea is the woman doesn't exist, but if you ignore that phrase, what he's trying to say is. Feminine enjoyment is structured through, through image, and through um, versus the male enjoyment is structured through the. You could even look at it like just Freudian, which is the penetrating of the of the of the realm of image, right? So, at, so at what point do you have to take into consideration this difference of enjoyment? And I think immediately, if you um. <laughs> that's what I do anyway, just because it's because it's like um, if if you have if you recognize your your mechanism of enjoyment uh, through essential create looking for essential patterns and universalities and being modes of being and you see it as masculine the sort of sort of masculine pursuit um, it will give you the tolerance for <laughs> tolerance Justin it will give you the tolerance for this other pursuit which is we're like well this is surface level it's like but is it or is it is it the structure or is it the essence of a sort of feminine enjoyment right and when you subvert feminine enjoyment through masculinity that's when people go oh you're being a dude you're like totally a buzzkill right like another way to put it is like bro you're being a total buzzkill i'm trying to femininely enjoy here and you're and you're talking about being in essence and, and i'm trying to you know work in the structure of actuality which is like say like the Demo the democratic party and this and whatever sort of politics it's like well how do they interact in and of themselves so so you run up against this hard problem of it's not that's i shouldn't say hard problem like hard problem of consciousness but you i would say the hard problem of gender this is the hard problem of, let, let's throw this let's formulate this which is if masculine and feminine enjoyment is very different uh how do you how do you negotiate reality that's 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 the hard problem of gender hmm. Okay. Right. I like it. So if your GF is a SJW, if you have a SJW GF epic style, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, okay, but how do you negotiate your your wish for that being, for that essential honesty, for that absolute, and also the feminine enjoyment which likes which doesn't like I'm gonna subvert radically the social order for this entirely different. It's like that that might not work for feminine enjoyment. Right. Mm. So it's how do you how do you integrate those the hard problem of gender? That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, one answer would be, <laughs> well, I mean, one answer would be that the traditional gender roles, the equilibrium that has evolved over time, and the kind of yeah, the, basically the traditional model, is precisely the evolved solution to that puzzle or paradox or challenge. Mm. In other words, there's a reason why there are certain inherited scripts about the things that men should do and the things that women should do and 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 the memes that we've inherited about what a, a male female relationship should look like there's a reason why those memes have have kind of outlasted the others and there's a reason why those scripts are still with us today and and mm -hmm. one one answer to your question goes that those are precisely uh you know the 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 human species best yet answer you know a, a answer to your question about how to how to how to coordinate um, 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 despite these these temperamental differences between between men and well, it's women it's more I, than temperamental it's the pure mechanism of being itself which is how do you get enjoyment if you get enjoyment from the imago from the imaginary realm or from the the way things are fitting together and you, you're sort of your sort of penetrative eros is based off of social reality like the feminine, you know, look in a Lacanian sense, in the feminine sense, and then yours is to like fucking just 
assert your masculinity and just rip it apart and then go boom <laughs> you know right then, then there's a inter there's a hard problem of gender in that it's like how do you negotiate this and then part of it is like through the family structure it's like i think i watched i watched one of your stream where, or no i read a blog post of yours and you said your wife is very like sort of understanding of like this of, of your pursuits and it's like that's that's the world of image which is the world of your relationship so the enjoyment is still there it's just focused in a different place whereas you're here you're here helping her with that in fact it's very symbiotic right whereas like the social order is almost like it's like yeah you're helping her structure that enjoyment your enjoyment is totally different it's totally different but it works Right. Is, is this how you talk to your girlfriend about like your issues with her when you have them? Do you, are you like, listen, honey, what's going on right now is my penetrative arrows is helping uh, you work through your name of the father. Yeah, sometimes. Do you talk to <laughs> do you, do you? Yeah, sometimes I'll throw it out there, yeah. <laughs> what, you, what does she think what does she think about you like talking with internet edge lords like me? At first, she didn't get it. At first, she was like, "I don't like memes," but now she's like, "Now she's like a memer. Now she's into the." But it's very much the fe you know, it's a different structure of enjoyment of it. Like she likes, she likes lore. Like right. feminine enjoyment has to do with lore. <laughs> there's like more like there's like this is the these are the people these are the players. There's Justin and Resin. Are they arguing? She wouldn't she wouldn't say stuff like that. But that's like sort of the if you're looking at the 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 accelerationist sort of structure like that it's a very sort of feminine look at it versus like right are we working out the ideas or the being essence and we're subverting it and that would be the sort of masculine uh, right well it's it's quite it's quite a uh, robust finding it's quite cross-cultural i believe that uh generally women uh have much more interest in gossip than men so what you just described lore is a nice way of putting it Another way of putting it is called. Someone accused me of having no lore, and I uh, thought that was funny. It so, said Ro Rosenstock has no. No, there was. There's like this group, and I like made like a really like carbon copy of it, and I said, "Here's a carbon copy of a group that got shut down." And they said, "Rosen, this group has no lore," and I was like, "Okay." <laughs> so, but I was like very interesting because I don't. I was designed to not. Like I designed it to not. But why did I design it to not, and other people need it? Right, so it's a different mechanism of enjoyment of the same apparatus or the same system. Right. Yeah, I could see that. I think there's also there's also a technique for solving your puzzle or the challenge that you raised, which is, you know, you can kind of, I think there are ways to, kind of, uh, jumpstart or ignite one's kind of feminine or masculine components or sub personalities and then kind of feed them or express them, or I don't know exactly the way I'm putting it, but manifest them maybe in a way that it is in the register of the other, the other half. So, yeah. so like, for instance, in Definitely. some sense, that's also part of what, what of my current kind of like cultural politics strategy or project, which is um, my drive for my, my, my interest in honesty and kind of uh, radical oversharing and, and stuff like this. In some sense, that's a very feminine, uh, modality that, you know, the, the, the drive for intimacy, the drive for, uh, closeness and, and everything, uh, it's vulnerability, it's warmth that these are all kind of feminine, uh, tropes. And, but I'm, I'm doing it in a kind of male status seeking income seeking aggressive public political, uh, project. And so in, in some ways, that's like one possible solution to your puzzle is you basically find ways to uh, make them make them into a positive feedback loop. And I think that's actually one of the one of the better ways to avoid being like, uh, uh, you know, avoid the pitfalls of like nasty, bad, uh, toxic masculinity, if you will. Uh, and also avoid the pitfalls of just being like a uh, overly sensitive, mushy, uh, uh, you know, uh, woman, <laughs> I don't know a better way to put it. Um, I like, like to, in I other like, words, I like the signifier soy boy. I like to, I, because I like to, I like to, I, I like to say I soy celery, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to feed into anything soy related. Uh, I'll show up to someone even at work outside of like meme sphere made fun of me for my, cause I would make every, I Are make a vegetarian. 
No, no, I'm not. I make a latte in the morning, and then I make a soy latte because milk, soy milk doesn't go bad. And I go, mm, nice soy latte. And this, this guy was making fun of me. He's like, it's like from chugging all that soy, huh? And I was just like, oh man, this is outside the net. It's wow. Like yeah, that's funny. Either. I've never heard anyone talk about that um, <laughs> outside of the internet. Yeah, no, I did. I was like, oh wow, here it is, IRL. I was that's like, listen, man, you gotta, you gotta accelerate soy. This well, is bad for you, man. Well, it's bad for you drinking all that soy. I mean, this is this is. <laughs> This is your Zizekian psychotherapy. Like soy is your synthome, and then you're kind of drilling into that synthome, and you're expanding it. You're accelerating it. It's you're a false it. hole. Lacan in seminar twenty three talks about false holes. So I would say your authentic synthome would be like would be like honesty. And then if we were to like create like false holes, we would be like my synthome is something else. And we try to link everything to that, but it's not really your synthome, which is like where you create meaning from, right? So I could create a false hole of soy. Well, we can actually think in the same manner. It's like, at what point does soy go through the world? And soy goes through, you know, soybeans, and it goes through, you know, it has this sort of root in, like, the Asiatic countries, and, it, you know, it can be used for vegetarian purposes. And we can, we can actually look at stuff like that. But it's, in terms of psychotherapy, it's, it can be useful to do that, but in terms of psychotherapy, it's separate. It's, you, can, you can already feel it's not as real. There's something missing. It's like right. dialectic. It's like an intellectual exercise versus your your actual sort of core symptom. Right. right. Interesting. Yeah, I'll have to. I'll, this is this will be interesting to digest. I, I, I'll think more about my symptom and my uh, my name of the father and all that because I wonder if I mean you, it's. I think you're perceptive to note that it's something like authenticity, but I wonder. Um, I wonder if authenticity is not a false hole because I you know I've been ex I've been accused of. People have have sometimes think that my whole shtick around like I'm just trying to be honest and authentic. Like people think I'm kind of like lying sometimes. Like people think, but that's your negative truth. Is you make it when you do do that, people know exactly what you're saying. So it's like it is honest. That's what I'm saying about the truth of language. Is like even that's a form of honesty because it's not designed to deceive. Right. It's simply it's simply not really. It's like designed to you know, communicate an idea in a certain form, which is more like acceptable in certain ways, right? I've never seen you as like trying to dis purposely deceive people. Some people think yeah. that. Some people think that this is, that everything I do is like this uh, kind of sinister plot to, I don't know what, but people, some people really do think that, I think. Even like BAP, the BAP saga, <laughs> like I could tell it was like done with like fun. It was done with like some flair. And then it was back, and then you said to Kantbot, that's what I was, I like that interview. And then you said to Kant bot, it was like, you sort of like let down that it, it had this sort of fun aspect. He was like, don't ruin it. It's like, don't <laughs> ruin it, Justin. You ruined it. I was giving you a chance. But that's, but that's the idea is it was always there. So you almost didn't have to ruin it because it was always intrinsic to it, right? Okay. Yeah. I try not to pull punches. I just lay it all out there, basically. Yeah. <sighs> I, I feel like we've been talking quite a while. You must be tired probably by now. What are you? Oh, uh, we, we. I think, you know what happened is we started talking about false holes and we actually sort of went into the system of false holes, which is like depressing, which is that yeah. thing that you're trying to fight against in terms yeah. of like, oh, you, you don't like honesty in terms of, or just, you know, whatever, whatever passes as honesty from the left, right? And we sort of, it's like a buzzkill because it's, it doesn't have that re resonance, searching for resonance, you know? Okay. But yeah, we can, we can end it if you want. So you, yeah, it. maybe maybe we accidentally re-territorialized momentarily. We did. We definitely did. Shame on us. Shit. Well, that was only talking about false holes. So you can't help but to once you enter a machine. That's the whole idea of Deleuze and Guattari. Is like that's why it's egoism and the absolute because you are yourself, but you are also part of a mechanism, right? So you're part of, you're part of this mechanism. So we talk about false holes. We get brought into the false holes. We get the lithiated sort of like. Yeah, but uh, luckily I've read enough to lose that I know how to break out of it instantly on how's demand. That? How's which that? is basically you just change the fucking subject and act like it never happened. So is your girlfriend listening to all of this right now? I don't know. Maybe. No, she's not because I have headphones on. So she's only hearing like half of it. But we'll, we'll probably listen to it later. Although I hate she, listening to my. But phone. she heard the other part. Yeah. Because you had your headphones out? Oh no, she heard she heard my voice. So my voice. 
so she can hear my voice. But she, has she heard anything I've said? No, but she will. She will. She'll listen to it probably. Well, <laughs> well, it's funny. A very interesting psychological event occurred when you said that you said something to the effect that your girlfriend could hear something, and after that moment my kind of mental model of this conversation changed dramatically because I'm, I've met since you said that I've been half imagining a third party in, in our conversation, basically. Mm. I've been like, I've been imagining your girlfriend, like at a table or something like on the other side of the room, listening to all of it. And no, we have a one bedroom. So she's like in the one bedroom. Okay. Well, it's just interesting <laughs> to note because ever since that you mentioned something to that effect, it's funny how it, it, it it's changed. I, 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 I updated my model of, of the conversation basically. And I was making, I was starting to kind of process some calculations about um, like this other person who I'm kind of maybe talking to, but I'm not sure. <laughs> mm. Well, you know, what's interesting is someone who's been like following the Zizek book and other sort of ramblings I do on the net, but I, I, my ramblings are off the Twitter. So like, I don't have any, like that was one of the things that I don't have any Twitter clout really. I have like um, all my like people who follow what I say are on Facebook, not Twitter. Dude, this so, this live stream is gonna drive you so many Twitter. Uh, only got the followers. Twitter clout. Nice. I was gonna say Twitter subs, but I'm cro I'm mixing metaphors now. Yeah, <laughs> but um, what the fuck was I saying? I'm kidding, by the way. Don't get your hopes up. No, you no, 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 no. What? The, no, okay. I'm trying to remember what I was. What? What the hell was I saying before you said that? If Someone you said, in the chat says you're. You seem like a cool guy. They just said that. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Oh yeah, they said they they thought I was some sort of Hegel hermit, so they were like oh. following me for a very long time, and then I mentioned something about a girl, you know, a girlfriend that I have over there, <laughs> and they were like, "What? I thought you were like a he Hegelian hermit, like a monk." <laughs> like, but I was like, "But that's exactly what it requires to be that sort of kind of person. If you have like that home life, then you have that sort of satiation, and then you then you can sort of." You can you can more easily access this sort of stuff. I find hmm. you don't have to worry so much about other shit. <laughs> you know, definitely. Oh yeah, definitely. Having a partner definitely helps you not get overly fixated on a lot of bullshit that people get fixated on when they don't have like a deep, meaningful, loving relationship in their life. Yeah. But yes, another problem is that if you do have a partner and you have at all a kind of stable, healthy, happy home life, all, a lot of people on the internet uh, will kind of count you out of their club in some sense. I mean, an extreme version of this is like incels, right? Like if you look at like incel communities, they're constantly like policing each other for having any type of uh, sexual success. You know, yeah. so like there, there's this cleavage in the incel community about, I think, I forget what they call them, like fake cells or something like that. I think incels th there's this like hierarchy in the incel community around the people who are like true incels like the wizards the 30 year old K yeah, yeah basically like there there are like Kage real Kage. there are real kind of <laughs> high-ranking incels yeah. and then there are people who get accused of um you know actually not being real incels they're fake cells and there's this like constant kind of like hierarchy sorting around yeah basically like if you happen to have uh success in like domestic sexual domains it actually um is is like a it's a mark against you in some internet communities is the larger point i'm driving at yeah it's the counter symbolic order so you have the symbolic order which actually exists and outside in meat space right and then that that and then you create a you create a hard counter to that right there's a question for you in the chat uh did you read the phenomenology of spirit from cover to cover someone wants to know like so many times you have like no really? idea huh. yeah that's like impressive multiple. hegel's hard man hegel's really really hard. yeah that's what it took the f i finished it i was like what did i read i don't know what i read right. and then so I, I read it again so i got through it again and again and again <laughs> so i've been i've no i've like i really like to do that you it, you have to like really want to be a hegel scholar you can't just like like philosophy you have to like really want to understand hegel to do that and i really did want to understand hegel and the idea that the individual is the universal it really spoke to me it really and in that you have access to the universal in the individual moment and what are the implications of that um 
that, you know, it's, it's big. I don't think it's dreamting into, like as Hegel would say, dreams into larger societies. Uh, laws, which he tried to sort of bring it into, oh, I'm figuring out what's actually, I think it's interesting if you just stop there. So if you just stop there, <laughs> it, you have a quite interesting nugget, which is the first half of the phenomenology. Um, you have every moment you're experiencing universal themes and you're experiencing your egoic self and your immediate finite self and you're experiencing language and you get brought away into the universal and back into the immediate you know we're talking about you know my girlfriend's there but we're also talking about girlfriends in general we're talking about, and how that sort of all interplays and you can't pull it apart and that's what's important about sort of hegel you know and also how it relates to deleuze and that's why foucault at the beginning of uh, anti-oedipus had to specifically say this isn't some fancied up hegel it's like well in what way is it so he had to say that because in a way it is <laughs> right he had to say that because there's something that reminds him of hegel Sure. And that's the and that's the larger system. How people, how the individual integrates into this sort of space, and how they aren't they aren't just their individual selves, right? They're breaking through the divide in some sort of sense. But you are. But in a way, I like to say, I, I reverse that and say you're not because you are this sort of individual actor. But you can have consciousness of what you don't have control over, in some degree. So that's sort of Freud is like to what sense. Freud says, oh, you have the unconscious, but you bring in a consciousness, but then there's the unconscious. So that's another way to look at it is like you're mitigating between the conscious and unconscious, the universal and the personal, and everything has implications from the individual into the universal, into the psychodynamic. So that's why I think it needs to be brought together because not because I'm creating a false whole or an abnormal synthesis. That's the opposite of what I'm, I'm like, kind of like you. That's, I think, why I appreciate you, which is that I'm trying to figure out what's fucking going on, you know? It's mm -hmm. like, what's going on in language? What's going on in, in uh, the way people are? You know? Yeah, that's, that's a really good synthesis. That's interesting way you kind of tie that all together. I think that kind of connects with something I've talked a little bit about before, which is I'm, I, people often accuse me also of like narcissism. This is a word that gets thrown at me a lot. Um, and, and it is true. I talk a lot about myself. <laughs> I, can't, I can't deny that. But I kind of really do think about it in, in terms similar to the ones you just described in, in a Hegelian register, which is that, look, like, I am what I know the best. It's what I have the most information about. And I do believe that if I can really figure out myself really, truly and deeply, that's actually my quickest and surest route to um, truly general knowledge about, about the whole. And I think there's some truth to that. Yeah, I I agree with that to some to some extent. <laughs> but then, but then it's like where do you where do I I have to look outside myself, which is actually only perceived within myself, right? Which is like to get that I really like that restaurant thing happened yesterday. I was like, wow, we're like really in a we're really we're really like we're like a molecular exchange in the same way. We're giving I'm giving money and I'm getting food. And it's vomiting food, but it's also accumulating money. It's accumulating oxygen. It's accumulating like power and nutrients for right. the capitalist machine. Right. <laughs> right. Well, that's what it's doing because we live. We live in a capitalism. I, the, that's what I learned that from the left. They said we live in a capitalism. And I said totally. It's very true. <laughs> I I also share your sentiment about how internet versus real life interactions are very interesting and, and kind of exciting and, and cool. Like when something on the internet appears in a kind of physical IRL form in some in some ways, it feels very interesting and live and it's kind of exciting from a kind of accelerationist perspective. And uh, yeah, I, I well, that's why one of the things I'm thinking about doing maybe, probably not anytime too soon, but it's kind, it's kind I've been talking about it with some people is maybe taking a stab at some kind of like an event like in the world <laughs> um like with this like with this live stream and my blog and all this kind of shit that i'm trying to piece together into like one system uh i'm i'm thinking about maybe organizing some type of like physical uh not like a conference but more like a party or something <laughs> mm. uh, and yeah i just think that like where i just basically invite people from the internet to meet up yeah. somewhere i'd be uh, worried i worry i worry about that justin because yeah, here's why? the problem Here's the problem. It's a singular conglomeration of all this enjoyment, which is sort of 
it functions with the distance, like the distance has a function. And then you're going to bring them all together. And guess what, Justin? I don't drink alcohol. That's okay. I don't like, I don't like smoke. Like I'm not fun. That's I'm okay. not a fun guy. <laughs> no, really. No, I want like, listen, okay. like I'm not, I'm not very fun. Okay. I play, I play chess. I play chess for fun. I like, I like electronic music. That might be the one fun part of me. Um, <laughs> and before, when I stopped, you know, doing drugs, I kept the electronic music. Okay. But I've like turned into like sort of a boring guy. So I think you would also have to keep in mind, you'd want to not just bring the people. You'd want to put them in like, if you're trying to create like a party, like a system that somehow works with these people that they can enter into this system and become a part of this yes. system and then yes. enjoy and then enjoy it with like structure, and like event and like different things people can do. Now that's, now you're picking up what I'm putting down. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. exactly the kind of thing I'm thinking about more, but people will, people will criticize this for, it'll sound totalitarian or like fascist to them, I think. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I want to create, I'm thinking about creating, like, you're right, party is just a, sh a stupid shorthand for it. Like, I'm I'm generally opposed to pleasure, so I, I, I don't see it as- <laughs> You're opposed like, to pleasure? What is that even? Well, I think, I wouldn't say I'm not fun. I think I'm pretty fucking fun, but yeah. I don't, I don't like normal forms of, of, of pleasure. I, and I think it's- Hedonistic enjoyment, simplistic. Yeah, I think it should be avoided and, and probably prohibited in some sense. Uh, <laughs> for the yeah. most part like i think people have way too much fun like they seek way too much pleasure i think but um the reason the reason that's relevant is because it, uh -huh. if i put together an event like a party is a simple way to to refer to it um but it would not at all be about like you know getting together ha to have fun or to seek pleasure it would be about well it would be an event in the kind of uh Baduian sense if you will is what i would be going for you know like i would want to produce a rupture of some kind like i would want i would want to to tear a hole in to kind of like the current status quo of my life. Uh, and, and for, for, you know, like, that's what I think the ideal event or, you know, a, a party in the, in the good sense of having a party should aspire to be, it should, it should be a, uh, a kind of positive break that separates, you know, yesterday from tomorrow in a way that uh, makes what is possible tomorrow totally different and more open than what was available to one, to all the members, you know, yesterday. And so that, that's my idea of like what a good party is. It's not really fun or pleasurable. It's, it's the creation of this kind of artificial system or experience in which everyone comes together for a, a kind of temporary transformation in the, in the direction of a kind of liberating or flourishing direction um through the the use of a variety of like artifices you know so you know what i would recommend to you is create a place that people can not just have an event at but come back to it's mm. sort of just an excelosphere mm. like they, like a place you know because mm. i think that's that's what has the staying power is like if you can like you have the body that is you know academia and thought and you just had like a like a like a place that just it just stayed there no matter what in like people in some like I've had an idea of right. creating a like a philosophy press. I thought because you know the only philosophy press in um, LA book fairs, like big book fairs, hmm. fucking Ayn Rand Institute. Really? Yeah. So I was like, there's a big <laughs> hole in this market. I was like, I could, I could, I could. Why do the philosophy it. presses that do exist? Why don't they go to places like the LA book fair? Um, people don't know how to navigate the the dystopia that is Los Angeles. They wow. see the anti, they see the anti intellectualism, and they're not cynical enough about it, which with the Senate, the proper way would be like, great. <laughs> okay, so let's look at how the capitalist flows are working and how can I work for their interests? And this is the egoism part and they work for my interests. How can I contribute to that, to the system and the system can help me, right? Dude, you should totally do that. I have a philosophy book for you. Literally, yeah, I have what? one already done and written. I can't find Ooh. anyone else to publish it. So you could publish it. Nice, all right. It's really, fucking, get... good. It's really fucking good, man. I'm telling you, it's good. Uh, but what should the name of... I'm looking for the name of the press. I, I keep thinking. I keep like throwing out, throwing out. A, I, my, I keep thinking of words. We'll have. I'll have to think about it. We'll figure. Well, are, it out. Would you mind sharing them with me in the hive mind, and we can help you? Uh, we can give you input on what is the best. I don't even remember. I was like kicking one around for like the longest time, and I was like, "Do I like this?" And then I decided I didn't like it, and then my brain got rid of it. I think. <laughs> Fair enough. But then there's, you know, there's. So if we looked at categorically what it could be, there's there's the West Coast, there's Los Angeles, and then there's philosophy, and then there's thought. Oh, then there's 
You know, someone already has soapbox actually, which is interesting. So there's explosive soapbox that's like anarchy. But um, you know, like something philosophy based. Like I like a pure philosophy press. Like I would like because you know zero is a cool press. It's like a but it's a it's a polit it's a politics press. Yeah, like it, it's a politics and philosophy press, but it's from a you know a material left perspective. Sure. So I, I would love to have a place where people like you could send stuff, but I would have to get the material means of production. I would have to get the press, or I could farm it out to the same place Zero does because my Zero book, I was like, oh, so I've actually looked into that. I was like, who prints who prints these? So I was like looking at this. I was like, maybe I could use them. Yeah, or dude, but you could you can do a lean <laughs> model all through Amazon. I mean, people do this. It's really pretty cool. Like, it, I think I. It seems to me oh, like I, I do a fair bit of research into the the trends in publishing right now because yeah, yeah. I'm exploring all these different options. Um, and my my sense is like you the, you could do a very lean, very uh, kind of small but really functional, nice small press type of project purely through through Amazon quite yeah. cheaply and effectively. I think. Yeah, then I wouldn't have to make Doug Lane so sad with my individual anarchism, because you know he's like he's not he's not one way to put it he's not sympathetic to that worldview. <laughs> yeah, I've talked with him before. Yeah, yeah, we, I, yeah. Books. I did the Zero Books podcast a while back, and uh, oh yeah, yeah. So we chatted before. Yeah, and I I see he's been very active on YouTube. I've seen that's yeah, yeah. But it's but it's yeah, it's a politics press. It would be interesting. I was like, there's a there's a gap in the market for a pure sort of philosophy press and i think specifically in los angeles and i was like i could i could do that i'll get on that i'm gonna get on that justin we'll yeah figure it out. dude I mean, <laughs> yeah i mean obviously like i'm a, i'm in a very very open-minded experimental mind uh mental state right now with all of my kind of future in 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 the in the balance and so i'm i'm it's been cool though because it's been really forcing me to think very openly and creatively about all the different possibilities for like how to constitute the ideal most free and radical but also productive and functional and and effective over the long term type of intellectual life possible and so i've been like doing a lot of research and and reflection on on what that looks like and looking at the trends and things like uh book buying behaviors and and money and stuff like that and when you drill down and actually look at the data it's pretty remarkable. Uh, I have a blog post in the works that's like in the hopper that ha I've been putting off, but I've, I've gathered a lot of the data and it's pretty remarkable. Like um, how, how self-publishing is really taking over. And a lot of the presses that you and I would think of as like quite prestigious and quite big presses, at least in my mental model are actually, when you look at them, they, they don't sell shit really. <laughs> um, uh -huh. it, it's quite interesting. Yeah. Like, I, I did I did some research where I looked up just to compare like I, just to do some like comparison case studies. Um, I, I look up there are ways to estimate book sales basically by kind of reverse engineering like the Amazon rankings data. So you can you can get like comparable estimates of how many books have been sold basically. And I did some kind of exercises just back of the envelope exercises of like looking at how many like what is the influence or success or reach of like a, a Verso book for instance that I would think of over the past few years I have in my mind is yeah, like Verso, the press exactly in the left yeah. it's like it's seen as like very high ranking yeah, like exactly. really important and prestigious and if you get a verso book like wow you're gonna really get a lot of respect and get a lot of readers and have influence um well if you look at the data um it, it's quite surprising it's let's just say underwhelming I think not to knock verso at all I read verso books still and, and whatever they publish some good stuff no doubt um but when you look at the data and then you compare it to what like pretty average people are doing with like not even very impressive books self-publishing on amazon uh the 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 gap in influence and readership and and certainly income because if you're publishing you're not sharing the, if you're self-publishing you're not sharing any income in all of those metrics of success when you drill down it's really surprising uh how 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 small is the gap you know we have in our minds we imagine that you know like a, a the average verso author is certainly having more reach and making more money than the the average self-published like philosophy writer or something like that. And it's basically not true. It's like actually not the case right now. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, if you look at like the most successful authors in the world right now, more than a majority of them are self-published are, are self-published. Um, even with debut authors, it's quite interesting. Like um, the only real benefit you get from going with the traditional press is if you're in the very small minority of the 
uh, big publishing houses, projects where they put a lot of money into making you like an absolute star, you know? So like, if you're, if you're like in that, in that tiny minority, you can do much better through a, a, a mainstream press with all of the support that they give you and the marketing or whatever. Um, but out accepting those kind of small number of outlier cases, even debut authors, um, there's not much of an advantage to going with like a traditional press nowadays. Um, it, it's quite interesting. I think the marketplace is changing very rapidly in ways that people like me who kind of came up through like prestige pathways or whatever, like academia or whatever. Um, I think the world is changing more rapidly even than, than people think on this. Would you side. say it's accelerating? You could even that say direction. it's accelerating. <laughs> right. That's right. Um, All right. So yeah, that's, just, that's cool. It's that's, I think I'm going to keep that in mind. And that makes me actually more psyched to do this because I was worried about like, I was like, why am I worried about physical means of production when, when, you know, we got, we got, <laughs> it's there. It's, you know, we can do it. It's Definitely. easily done. Definitely. I think, I think you'll see more and more of it. I think, and, and I think like before, sooner than we think places like Verso and even some of the bigger publishing houses, uh, sooner than we think, like they're not even going to be able to survive anymore. And more and more like book reading culture will just be a, uh, bewildering quantity of different kind of small niche presses and basically communities of readers and writers, basically publishing each other for themselves and ind individual, you know, agents just publishing for themselves. Yeah. And I have a science fiction book and I didn't know what to do with it because I, I read, I wrote this, but before I wrote this, I was working at a car dealership and I did data input. And if I don't, I figured out a way to do the data input job in like 30 minutes. It was taking other people like eight, eight hours. I don't know if they were also doing it in 30 minutes, but <laughs> I could do it in 30 minutes. I said, I have so much free time. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write a full book Hell on yeah. the clock, on the clock. I'm going to get paid to write this book. Hell yeah. <laughs> so I, so I did all the data input immediately. I like did not stop. I would like go and then I would like do it as literally as fast as I could. Like I would like race to like finish it. And then I wrote this book called, Anaclesis, which is about uh, a future Los Angeles where there's the unemployment rates like really, really high, and then everybody's trying to get a job. And there's sort of this person who has to manage this sort of Freudian relationship with her boss, right? And then it follows her, and her and her friend are both sort of drug addicts. They're addicted to this sort of synthetic drug, which is like a pseudo like opioid. And so they're like managing their addiction they're, and they're also managing the fact that this corporation essentially has so much power where it has police power where it can like, it can just take people off the street and like torture them and kill them for whatever reason they want. So then, you know, it, it follows that. So I wrote, I wrote that all on the clock Wow. and I was like, what am, I was like, what am I going to do with this, this sci-fi book that I wrote? And so it's been sitting there for like the editing pro I wrote the writing and editing was like, three or four years, but maybe I'll just put it on this. We'll like, we'll figure it out. Dude, <laughs> yeah, you should definitely, got books sitting around. You should definitely self publish it. Dude, like self publishing on Amazon. It's literally as easy as uploading one file. Basically I've never done it, but I've, I've been researching it as I said. That's and, funny. uh, and then there's like, a, <laughs> what's that? That's funny. It is funny. I find, man. I find and, it highly uh, amazing. It, it's, I think it's, I think it's really exciting ultimately, like for people who are interested in like radical heterodox, like creative intellectual work. I mean, it, it's super exciting. It's, it's amazing really. And, uh, you know, it's only one extra step to basically, instead of just self publishing, just throw up a little like front company <laughs> and then like publish yourself, uh, through like your front company and then publish your friends through that front company. Yeah, I mean. And I have like, you know, I, because this Freud group, like we, it doesn't mean much to people in the Twitter sphere. But it has like you know seventy five, seventy six thousand people in it. Has mm -hmm. people that have been in it and are using it every single day, and it feeds Wait, into this is the you Facebook, know, your Facebook group. Yeah, it's a Facebook group. It has a quarterly magazine that I publish. Um, like it, it it's self sustaining. It creates this sort of environment, but it's contained in in this in this sort of um, place. Well, you said seventy thousand members. Yeah, seventy five point something. Wow, that's a lot. It the, is. Is that the one you recently invited me to? Probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's the name of it? It's oh god, it's Sigmund Freud's dank meme stash. Oh, okay, that's that's funny. But that's that sounds really big. Yeah. So and that, and you have a you publish something out of that regularly? Yeah, I publish a. I call it the Young Freudian. So anybody who has a idea like a philosophy idea and they like just want to like crank out like a, you know three hundred to five thousand words and they're like I have this idea. Where do I do this? 
like do I have to do I have to get it published by this like academic journal that no one cares about? It's like no, you don't. Send it to me. I'll put them together. I'll also throw it. Now I've started throwing it into a reading thing, so I can put the vo voice like a robot version on YouTube, so people can hear. When you hear your own book, when you hear the words you wrote, and I think when other people hear, it's different. Mm -hmm. It has a more powerful impact, I think. So yeah. I, you know, I like these ideas. So for people who like ideas in and of themselves and find them liberating and find new ideas liberating and find the opportunity for people who have philosophical interest to express themselves. I think it's a big, it's like a, it's a nice thing. That's awesome. Yeah. You, that's all digital though. You don't print stuff, do you? No, I don't. Although people are like, can I print it out? And apparently people have been printing it out. That's cool. And like, can't mostly the people who do that one person in Boston, one person in New York was doing that. That's cool. That's awesome. Yeah. So you you already have a leg up. You should definitely pursue some sort of like independent press. Like honest, I think we'll get to a point where like anyone who's like intellectual and creative and productive and disciplined will they or their friend is going to have a press, and that's just how people write books. And I think that's awesome. Yeah. Um, just make a word. Just make a WordPress. You got a WordPress account. You have some Amazon links. Yeah. Like it's awesome. It's a, like <laughs> so. If, for instance, yeah. like. A little bit of the data is coming back to me. I don't remember it, but I need to organize it and publish it. But uh, like I did the the exercises I did, like BAP, like the Bronze Age Pervert book. Yeah. Um, is basically like it was more influential in terms of reach, in terms of readership, and in terms of, and also certainly in terms of income, how much money it made for Bronze Age Pervert. Um, like significantly more successful and influential than even like f people you and I would think of as like famous verso authors. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's like quite, it's quite interesting. The world, the, the, the playing field is not what a lot of people think it is. I think. Well, that's what I said about, you know, it doesn't really matter what, you know, people will be like, Justin Murphy is great or Justin Murphy. He's, he's a troll. It's like the, the material thing is you put in a lot of work and you put in a lot and you, and your analysis, you know, you, your analysis is like, it's like consistent and it has like, so it's like whether or not. People don't dialectic that. You can't like dialectic that. There's like the material thing which you're talking about, right? So it's like if you do that, if you do that, if Bronze Age pervert does that, if he puts in the work to like, if he feeds into the algorithm, that's he right. Like feeds in, he feeds into it, and then people want it. It's just it's there's going to be an exchange whether or not someone wants to regulate it or not. Yeah, that's there's, absolutely there's the right. Flow of capital. Yeah, you're like you're either a functioning machine that's plugged into like the other functioning machines. Or you're not. not. And like what it's people not. what people think they like or dislike or the adjectives they use or don't use actually like means nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's like does it function? And how does it function? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Dude, this Let's has been uh, yeah. this has been really fun and interesting. You're a really easy guy to talk to, Elliot. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah it's, it's been good, good, to, good to talk with you. you know? Yeah, I feel like I'm I'm running out of steam a little bit now. Yeah. All right. Let's uh let's call it. Not in a bad way, not because in any way this got depressing, as you suggested before, but just- Yeah, no, this is a better place. Like before I was like, eh, this is better. No, it's, you're right. You, you never want to end <laughs> it on, on you, you never want to end it on anything less than like the, the best possible note. So I'm with you. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just uh, flagging that I'm not bringing the conversation to a close for any uh, ulterior negative okay. reason whatsoever. Gotcha. All right. Um, Mutual yeah, so, agreement. Uh, why don't you plug your book one more time and anything else you want to share with people? Uh, I know you said you don't have a lot of Twitter followers, so hopefully you'll get a few from here. <laughs> People, if you've enjoyed this, go follow uh, Elliot on Twitter and whatever yeah, else you, you do now. <laughs> well, this is this is the book. It's I think Justin put it in the in the bio link, which is Zizek in the clinic. Uh, if you look at this cover, I love this cover because it's the sim you have. I I think of it as the symbolic order. You have the sort of unconscious, and then you have the mirror where you're mitigating it. Wow, did what you choose did. the cover? I did choose the cover. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Good. Cool, dude. Well, um, yeah, awesome. Thanks for sharing your ideas. And I definitely, I haven't read the book yet, but I might. And uh, now I know your ideas like much better than I did before. So that's always a pleasure. And uh, yeah, this has been, this has been really fun. Like I said, you're, you're, some people are, you know, easier or more difficult to talk with. And you were definitely on. Justin, I talk to people for a living. I'm a that's therapist. Right. That's right. Remember? Like... Well, that's true. That comes through. <laughs> that comes through. Yeah. It definitely comes through because, uh, we got into a really fun, interesting rhythm very easily. So I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah, it was cool. All right, dude. I'll let you know when this gets put to the podcast, which I'm doing more consistently now. Cool. All right. All right buddy. I'll be in touch with you. Thanks again for coming on. Sounds good. All right. Yeah, take hope, it to talk, hope to talk to you again at one point.
Yeah, definitely. We'll stay in touch for sure. Yeah, we can. Yeah. You do a thing, don't you? Do you do? Yeah, I do. Yeah, it's just been me and the and Doctor Bones, but I need to figure that out. Yeah, well, <laughs> invite me on. I'll come hang out on your thing. Oh, nice. All right. Yeah, if I'm down want. to do Up that. To you. Whatever. Yeah, I'm down. All right, cool. We'll be in touch, Elliot. Take it easy, man. All right. Yeah. So long, sir. Later, dude.